Photography Chat with Merlin. Photography Chat with Merlin. Awesome. Welcome to another episode of the Photography Chat. We're uh, season three, episode 26, and we've got Ryan with us today. Uh, you you want to take a minute to say hi to everyone there, Ryan? Hey, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Um, very excited about this, Merlin. I'm excited to have you on here. Um, do you want to just uh, say a little bit about yourself there? Yeah, so I'm a film photographer that used to live in the West Coast or on the West Coast. Uh, recently located, uh, relocated back to the Midwest, good old Iowa. And, um, I'm trying to find my footing here. So <laughs> I kind of shoot the same things I even did in California, just sort of rural landscape stuff, sort of like the detritus of America type <laughs> of a thing. So what, what pulled you uh, back to the Midwest? I'm from here. So my family's all here. Um, I think a little bit of what happened was, you know, the whole COVID thing hit and I was in San Francisco and it was kind of like, what am I doing? I can't even enjoy this beautiful city right now. And and we had bought a house as sort of an investment uh, about a year before that back here in the Midwest. And we just decided to make the, pull the trigger and, 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 and make the jump. So. That's what we did. I was just going to say you bought a house in San Francisco and it was going to be like, holy shit. But, you know, mid- <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, mid- no. Midwest bought makes more sense. I, yeah, we were going to um, kind of use it like a corporate rental, you know, make money off the rich people. <laughs> that was the idea. I mean, eat the but, rich when you can, right? If you can, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you can, they're, you're, they're usually the ones feasting on us. So it's like, it's always good yeah. to flip it around. Yeah, that's sort of what it- like even because you know we had this like little scheme to make a little extra like, loot while living in a very expensive place. Um, what are you talking about? And, San Francisco is so affordable. Yeah, I, I know. Isn't that funny? Like I owned a business. I owned a window cleaning company there for fifteen years, and you know we could have been it could have been huge, but unfortunately, there's just no there's no like workers in San Francisco anymore. There's nobody. You can't. There's no one to hire. There's no one works there. You know, it's, it's all, it's all, it's all yeah. And kind of, or, or finance or however else, you know, people make a lot of money. So Just bros, I guess, you know? Yeah, it was tough. It was tough to uh, leave. I loved San Francisco. It, it, it afforded me a lot of uh, good times, met a lot of great people, um, got back involved in photography while I was there. So that was huge. And, um, and it's kind of fun now to be back in the Midwest and sort of spread the the film gospel here, you know. That's fair. I, I gotta say, I'm I'm a little jealous of your your beard action you've got going on there. Um, my yeah, mine's I, like a baby I, beard. I was, <laughs> I was, uh, I'm used to like spring or fall weather all year round. Having just lived in San Francisco for quite a while, and it is it is hot here in Iowa. It's hot, so and so I don't know how much. You think they're chopping it down? Yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah. Yeah. I, at least in the summers, you know, like I'm, I'm of Swedish descent. So this stuff grows quick, you know, it won't be for long, but summers are tough here. I, I'm, I'm, I'm learning that again. I grew up here. I grew up, you know, in the first 17 years of my life or, or 18 were in Iowa and then I split. So that's (laughs) good. So when yeah, was, was I, hot. oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying like big reason was because it was hot and I must have forgotten that. So, <laughs> well, it's a, so I moved back to Vancouver during COVID and I forgot one of the things I hated the most was the rain. And what does it do here a lot? It It's either rain or it's like blistering hot. Where were you before, before Vancouver? Uh, I was in Toronto for about five years. Oh, really? Which also uh, yeah, my girlfriend and I are actually, she's from the Boston area, so we're going to be rolling uh, out east here in about a month. Nice. And we're, we're super hyped about that, but one of our stops is Toronto. Oh, that's so awesome. I've well, never been. She's been I'm, I'm hyped. So. If, you, if you do spend some time in Toronto, definitely stop by Downtown Camera. Uh, they have all sorts of great uh, film there, and the staff is super friendly. 
And, um, you know, they've been doing some of their own hand-rolled uh, Cinefilms. So they've got, it's called Prototype 640T, which is basically Cinestill 800. Uh, they've got Prototype 400, uh, which is basically 400D Cinestill, but it's their own concoction. And um, a few other ones there. And just all sorts of other, like, film and stuff. And they've got a great lab, so if you're there for, like, a few days... You could even drop some yeah. stuff off with them and they'll be able to get oh. through it. Yeah, that's right. So like we're going to be going So her family every year goes and stays on an island on Lake Winnipesaukee. And so um, I get a taste of like old East Coast people. <laughs> it's really cool. I, I actually really enjoy it. Uh, getting to dip into that lifestyle a little bit because that's not how I grew up, you know? Um, and uh, it's, it's, it's a very interesting place. Uh, New Hampshire is weird. And so um, we, we basically built this whole road trip around uh, that trip. So it should be exciting. My girlfriend flies back, but then I'm going to actually road trip all the way back through oh, dang. Good USA. So get to see some really weird shit like usual, you know? So well, if you're going through New Hampshire, you got to try and link up with uh, Pete Gamascus. Okay. Yeah. He's a, he's a large think- format guy. And uh, he's yeah, the he's the guy he bought Jason Lee's Lincoln. Yeah, I think I know him just because of Instagram, and and I, I follow him actually. Yeah, he's rad. Yeah, I think he bought his car, didn't he? Jason he did. Lee's car. Yeah, he he bought the he he bought the Lincoln. He calls it. <laughs> that's so cool. Hey, that's super cool. Hey, can I ask you a question? When people pop up on this, is it cool to like say what up? Yeah, yeah of course. Um, so there's a guy. I don't know if he's still. Uh, watching that but sean murphy he's a professional photographer he just rolled up onto the feed here a little earlier and um talk about a guy who's like super rad and talented and um sean murphy good dude that's awesome what's up sean yeah i think back in florida now but he was a la guy for a long time Weird. Apparently my audio is breaking up for the other people out there. Are you having trouble hearing me there? I, I hear you great. Um, huh. Is it on maybe? Are they having a hard time hearing me? I don't know. Yours is coming through. They, apparently it's mine. Uh, it could be Instagram too. Who knows? Um, you know, fucking Weird. Instagram. Well, um, great. But the audio will be great on the podcast if uh, you have trouble listening to this or you got to tune out. Um, I'll upload the audio from the roadcaster later, so that should be okay. Um, so in Iowa, is that where you got started with uh, photography, or did you find that when you uh, came out west? No, definitely here in Iowa. Um, uh, I don't know if it was like I didn't do anything in school. It was definitely through my dad and my mom. They always shot photos and stuff. Um, my dad took it pretty serious. Like he's a, he's an avid photographer and, uh, he does it for fun. Just a passion. And I definitely, uh, caught the bug through just experiencing his joy through it. Um, but really didn't have any sort of setup at all. Um, just sort of shot with, plastic stuff or like, you know, like the little, cause I'm a child of the eighties, early nineties, I suppose. So, um, it was all film, you know, all the time. And I think what happened to me was, um, once I got a little older, I, I just couldn't grasp the digital. I just didn't get it. I didn't enjoy it. I didn't, I tried, but I'm, I mean, you just saw how hard it was for me to like turn my camera up. Right? You know what I'm saying? Like, uh, well, and, I mean, and, Technology gets us at the best of times, so. Bro, I, I just, I don't get it. I don't want to know, like, programming. I don't want to know how to edit stuff. I don't like it. So a lot of the stuff I shoot's all in, in camera. Like, I do a lot of the old peel-apart stuff, and it's like, if it's not right, then tough bananas, you know. Um, that's just how I enjoy shooting. And so, you know, I took a big break, like a huge, like, you know, bartended and was acting a fool and stuff and didn't even think about photography for a very long time. And, uh, when I was living in Colorado, didn't really here and there, I picked it up a little bit, like always sort of thought I had that passion, but didn't really pursue it. And then even took like some community darkroom classes, some 
old crotchety angry photographer in Boulder, Colorado. <laughs> he had a he had a lab, and he was. Um, I mean, he definitely bummed everybody out that was taking the class because he was probably mad he didn't make it or something. And um, but that resource is there, so I sort of got it, played around with it there. But again, it was film. Um, and then I had even picked up a Mamiya six four five. Those are um, from, yeah, from a buddy who uh, was a professional photographer for snowboarding, and they were all going digital. And so he's like, "Hey, you want this camera?" And so I threw him a few bucks. And so I had this, I had that camera, and from that time, I'm now realizing I actually shot a ton. You know, you, this is like in my twenties. Um, I shot a ton of photos during that time, um, but I didn't have like the confidence to get anything developed or process. And so like today I actually practice processing with different chemicals and stuff with those old roles. Oh wow. And then, yeah, man, like, you know, we're talking 20 years ago now, some of them that have just not been treated well. And I'm just playing with them now. And, and I gotta be honest, I should, I, I should have given myself more credit when I was young. younger. Ryan should have been more confident. Some of the stuff I shot was cool. You know, so I don't know. That's been kind of fun. That's something I've done, been going through lately and looking at um, while I kind of play around with processing and whatnot. But it's, so in other words, it's always sort of been there, but like I didn't really take it seriously until like I'd say 2015 is when I, I, I think it was that it was 2014, I really found it again. Um, and since that time, you know, seven or eight years ago, I, I've just not looked back. It's just been constant. And, and what brought you back to it then? Uh, <laughs> so I was really over like social media and stuff back in the day, like back at that time. And so I was like, you know, F Facebook, I want off this and I don't like it. And a buddy of mine um, was like, dude, you should check out Instagram. <laughs> I'm sure I'm super <laughs> in 2015, but I was like, ah, I don't think so. That just sounds horrible, you know, like, I, I don't get it. And uh, do you know the magazine Monster Children? Yes. Yeah, it's like kind of like, I don't know, lifestyle, surfing, skateboarding, art, a lot of art. I think they're out of Australia. And uh, I think, anyway, uh, a friend of mine was like, hey, you should check out, there's a, come come to like this like photo annual party with me and it was for monster children so i checked it out and then this is the same friend who's like hey you should you should get into instagram and whatnot and as i was checking out monster children magazine i realized that jason lee had a guest edited edition like he was a guest editor and so like, there's a whole monster children just about him and his photography and you know, he was the skateboarder, my mom, the guy from Mall Rats in my head, you know, so I had no idea he shot photos or anything like that. And I didn't even think about film photography at all. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, photography was digital, and I, I didn't have any want to learn that. And so when I picked up that Monster Children and I found out that he had an Instagram called Film Photographic and, and more about his photography and what he was doing with film photographic is sort of like a platform to share and, um, you know, pump people up about photography and, you know, hype, hype, hype up other photographers. Uh, I gotta be honest, man, right then and there, it clicked. I was like, Oh shit. Like this like skateboard hero guy of mine and like a guy I knew about when I was living in Iowa, and I was, you know, a little high school guy, like, just in love with mall rats and stuff like that, you know, like watching it like every day uh, and pretending I could skateboard. I, uh, I immediately joined Instagram and just picked up that medium format camera again for the first time in a long, like a very long time, like 10 years over, over 10 years. Damn. And I uh, got a couple frames from just around and then hashtag film photographic. And I, I kid you not, man, like, I got shared on film photographic and he hit me up and was like, dude, cool stuff. And from that moment, like I was just really hooked, you know, my mom joined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw that there. Hey ma. 
Um, so that's how I got back into it. Like I just was like, just a little bit of positive feedback, you know what I mean? And like a little bit of like someone who I was pumped on when I was in high school, like was doing it and was doing cool stuff with it. And, you know, I don't know him. I didn't know him at all. You know what I mean? I, he was like an actor. I didn't know him. But like the fact that he was, he was so like, he interacted and, and he, he just would pump you up. You know, he was just like, spreading the good word of photography and film photography. And so I just took a deep dive after that and like just shot that Mamiya pretty much shot it until it broke. And then, you know, still need to get it fixed. But, uh, since then, man, just like collecting cameras, shooting constantly, it's been really fun, you know, and it's something that like, you know, like the ups and downs of life that has always been like kind of a constant now for me in the last seven years or so, or seven years or so. It's been great. That, that's actually kind of wild because Jason's kind of a common thread with a lot of photographers I've talked to, on with the chat over time is um, uh, so many people have like found like either film photographic really inspiring um, or just even him. And it, it is really cool how accessible he is. Um, oddly enough, he's also like why I got into film photography and like back into photography in a big way. Um, not long after you did, probably around like... 2017 um it was his polaroid yeah. stuff that like really blew my mind and then was like holy shit i want to do eight by ten polaroid like jason lee and then i looked at how much that shit cost and i was like this is why jason lee does eight by ten full <laughs> you know man like I, I had no concept about peel apart film i didn't know about that like that wasn't even in my orbit you oh, that, know? That's just so magical though. Like, so there was an, I, I'm in a old motel here, which is uh, converted into an artist studio right now. So I've got like a little um, photography studio and I've made like a podcasting booth here and stuff. But uh, last weekend was our official opening of the city center artists lodge. And uh, so we had like open studios for two days and shit, I must've done over 70 portraits on pack film with my Wista over the weekend. I bought this like ridiculous, like uh like 80s laser background like from old like school photos and shit and uh was cool. doing like you know portraits for 10 bucks a piece and people were just going nuts for them it was it was kind of crazy but like the magic That's of the dope. peel people go so nuts for it it's true how do you peel yours i seen like some peel from the top there like it, it keeps a nice cool border on there oh you know, like the, the dirty, dirty so that's that's the dirty peel yeah yeah. So how do you do your, um, I always, well, so it, it depends. So, um, when I was doing the shots for, um, the, the portraits, I just did like the clean peel, like the regular one. You just pull it from the top and, and do it, but you didn't brown knuckles all over the fingers. Yeah. Yeah. But then when, uh, when I'm doing it for friends and stuff, I'm like, Hey, do you want a clean peel or a dirty peel? And they're like, Ooh, what's a dirty peel? <laughs> so they're always like yeah i want the dirty peel and like the best way i found to do the dirty peel is um oh i can't really do it here but this is like the negative but i always like pull the top white part of the positive here and i just yeah. pull that whole thing and then i just like take the whole thing apart there <laughs> i love it man I mean, I'm, I'm totally hooked i still buy it way too like been way too much money on them and yeah i've had good luck had bad luck have you have you messed around with the super sense stuff <laughs> um i have yes um yeah it, it's it's interesting it's really cool um i yeah. like it a lot what i think a lot of people get pissed off with it about is like they think it's a brand new film so they expect it to behave like a brand new film and it's not it is like a bespoken boutique handmade experience from Austria, which is why it costs yeah. like an ungodly amount of fucking money for it. Because like uh -huh. literally people in dark rooms put that shit together by hand for you. Like it's, it doesn't get more customized than that for, for like film. Um, but I also really dig how the color comes out because it looks like, you know when you shoot that expired 669 and it just has that really nice sort of like like the colors have gone all soft and stuff and it's just like yeah that's what it comes out it's like every yeah. time 
It's very beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's it's absolutely beautiful. And the thing that's nice with the the Super Sense stuff though is like sometimes with the six six nine, it does you don't get the full you don't get the full spread. So it's like you get that color, maybe it's a little janky. With Super Sense, you get that color, but you get mostly a full spread almost every yeah. time, which is cool. Yeah, it smells weird. I gotta though. be honest. Even when I get like packed, it's pretty uniform. So if I if I tear the first one right, and then I'm only getting part coverage. Even like my rollers can be impeccable and everything, and it's just gonna be that pack is gonna be that. But it's still consistent too, so you can actually figure out how to make that work for you a little bit in the frame. There's a town, and this is hysterical. It's spelled exactly like Cairo. Oh wow! Right, like, but it's Cairo is how they pronounce it, <laughs> and it's in Illinois. Yeah, yeah, man. Why not? Right? Well, it's like, it's like Miami, uh, it, but it's Miami. Miami. Yeah, yeah, and then exactly. there's N- Nevada, but it's Nevada. Nevada. Yeah. Well, here's this is Cairo, and it's literally it was a pretty pivotal point in the um, Civil War. It was the fight over the Ohio River, and the North won, but it was like a pivotal place. So it has so much history. There's a lot of like huge old mansions there, but literally all of them are falling down. And I think there's like a thousand people that still live there, but it looks like it's the largest like ghost town I've ever been in. Oh, wild. And I photographed, you can see, you can tell it used to be this like beautiful, like historic, like very, very well off town. Like shit captains live there and things of that nature. Right. And there's this downtown that has just literally been forgotten and buildings are just in rubble, like falling down and no one gets rid of the buildings because who has money for that? So there's all like, there's this old hotel where the back of the hotel is falling backwards like this, and the bricks all gone and you can see inside of it. The front reminds reminded me almost of like New Orleans where they have those iron terraces, like okay. those beautiful portals. So it was an old hotel. Well, I photographed that, and where it cuts off is right along, like, like, like the photograph is perfectly like part of it is missing, where where it didn't spread correctly. But the part it captured, it was so perfect, man. Like it's like one of my favorite photographs I've ever taken. And it's just because I I was like, okay, so this side is going to be blank probably. So I sort of tried to like mash it up to to what I was shooting and it just worked perfect. I was so hyped on it. That's and it's cool. like, it's like fun. Shit. I mean, like, yeah, dude, that shit with a digital camera. <laughs> I mean, like you could, I guess, I guess you could, but well, you'd have to do a bunch of editing, which is no fun. Like, you know, it's, this just happened, you know, it's just, it was, it's how it wanted to behave. And that's what it turned out. You know, that's why I enjoyed it so much. Anyway. Sometimes though you get those packs that kind of sound like the beach when you shake them, and those moments are super sad because it's like. <laughs> I know. Well, I mean, you know, not to continue to refer back to Jason, but like a lot of his stuff's dried up now, which is so sad. You know. Yeah. It's just a heartbreaker. <laughs> And he stores his stuff perfect. It's just like, what are you going to do? It's old. Yeah, it's just old. Yeah, but sometimes Raymond has in his stories when they dig into the stash and they, they do stuff and it turns out and that looks really cool. Like, You talked to Raymond yet? Not yet. So I, I've been trying to get him on and um, Jason's going to do another, like a follow-up when he's off his Instagram break. Um, we're going to like talk about uh, his, some of his latest book projects and stuff because w- what sucked... The first time I had him on, he was on an Instagram break. And so I had to do this really kludgy fucking thing where I had him on Zoom, but then I was like putting the Zoom onto Instagram through this like third party app. And Instagram got rid of like the one hour limit um, when you're doing lives. But that one hour limit 
still applied to this like weird third party app I was using and I had no idea. So like midway through him and I talking, the live just like cut off and it was like shit. And like it, it kind of worked out good because like he hit like a natural pause where he was talking. So it didn't look like awkward, but then like it was kind of an interesting moment because like I was asking him about like Del Mar skate ranch and stuff. And like, he was just sort of like drawing back memories from that. And then like, we still talk for like another, like, almost 40 minutes after the live broke down because he just like was thinking about all this stuff and it was like wild hearing him talk about these stories where he was like fanboying out about Tony Hawk and he's like him and his friends went down to Del Mar and like holy shit that's Tony Hawk and look how ridiculous he's dressed. I've <laughs> grown up in Iowa man that shit's like mythical I, it, I can't even imagine that you know like that was like one of the people like when I found like when I was like so when I got into photography again. I got, you know, every podcast I could find, everything I could do, like all the, I was just collecting books and cameras and everything. And, and then I realized like, oh shit, there's other people that are doing film photographic. And so I, I checked out their work and stuff and Randy, man, holy smokes, that dude is so good. His, Amazing. His work is, cool. it's just unbelievable. Beautiful his, work. His Polaroids book is just magnificent. I love it. it it's a great I one. love that. Eric also yeah, has some great work too. Um, I, I like. Oh, he is, what a part of a guy that he is! Like, Eric's an amazing person. And they all are. They were everybody's super cool, but Eric is a sweetheart for sure. He he keeps a good crowd and. And it's funny, like with with uh, you, you kept mentioning mall rats and stuff there, and like you know, it's it's funny that there's this Jason link because it it comes up more often than not when I'm talking to people. But um, I met him for the first time when he was doing the Leica workshop in Boston. Um, Alan Evans convinced him to come to Boston and do a workshop and book signing yeah, from Plainview. Yeah. yeah, I think I remember. Yeah. Yeah, and so I, I decided to, like, you know, take a chance and, like, go down and see this thing. And uh, it was it was an expensive ticket. And then after I bought it, I was immediately worried. I was like, what if he's a dick? And it just, like, ruins everything for me. Because, you know, they say never meet your heroes kind of thing. And, uh sure totally opposite like he's one of the nicest people i've met like the only person nicer that i've met was fred penner and he's like a kids tv show guy from like the 80s so that makes sense um (laughs) but when i was getting my book signed from him the first day i was like i may never get this opportunity to like be this close to him where it's like almost touching distance kind of thing and so it was my turn to bring a book up and get him to sign it and uh i'm like I'm so sorry about this, but um, could I interest you in a chocolate pretzel? <laughs> classic, classic mall rat. I'm like, I'm so sorry. Like, I just don't know if I would ever had another chance to like say that to you. And he's just like, oh man, <laughs> he kind of did like a groaner moment. And then he's like, ah, I kind of laughed about it. But he was really cool. Like we did a photo walk with him the next day in Boston and uh, Armand was there and uh, that was where Armand and I became great friends. Um, I love Armand to death. Like one of the best people I know. He is. Yeah. We're we're debating right now. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Did you ever meet Dustin? Dustin Beatty? in Manhattan? I think, yeah, I think I did meet Dustin at a Policon, I think. Yeah, he he does. He I guess a long time ago he did Anthem magazine. Okay, and that's when um, Jason we collaborate, do work with him and stuff, do photos and stuff. And I think that's when he shot Dennis Hopper was for Anthem. And I got to give Dustin BD a lot of credit because I think he was a driving force in me being part of the um, our our Los Angeles show through Film Photographic and and. Um, Letty as well, and, and that whole crew, man. Like, like all those people keep great company. They're all doing shit. They're all doing rad stuff. And, like, Dustin is an amazing photographer in his own right, and he's always doing really rad stuff. But that friend of mine who actually told me about Instagram knew Dustin. They actually had done projects together. And then through Dustin, through all that, it, it just kind of, like, snowballed into, like, me being part of – that show in Los Angeles with film photographic. And I mean, talk about it's like, what the fuck, you know, like (laughs) out of nowhere, man, you know, like within a few years of just me picking up a camera again, I'm going to be in a photo show with just the raddest people and people who are amazing photographers. It's cool. 
that, really cool. that show is actually super cool. So like I bought the book recently cause you can still get it on film photographic. I think there's still some copies of it. Um, so yeah, it, tiny- yeah, the tiny little book, but, um, the video, there's like a video that uh, Explordinary did of it. Fucking Dude, amazing. People, the folks at Explordinary are unbelievable people. Yeah. So they did a great that that video yeah. though, like if you guys haven't had, had a chance to go see it, it's um I think if you Google like our town Explordinary, uh you should get a link to it. And um it's it's a documentary they did about everyone that took photos uh for that show and uh it, it was really cool, like just getting to hear people's thoughts behind everything and uh I gotta say my favorite one though was was uh Eric's like hearing him talk about like his experience with like the people and stuff and just like seeing him interact with everyone. I was just like, this guy's like fucking good shit. Like, you know, I've always appreciated True. Eric. True. I mean, and just like deep roots in Los Angeles and just like, just such a good dude, you know? Yeah. And then like through that crew too, like, um, there's like some other folks that I met through them that are part of like the Redlands crew. Like they do like all like the Redlands. Oh man, I'm blanking on what's called like some like art district there. But like James, he's an amazing painter and photographer. And um, Dusty Ferguson, he does really great photography. He just came out with a book. But all these people are like kind of like, involved in, in part of that whole crew of, of people who are just doing cool work, always doing really rad stuff and are always quick to involve others. You know, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's cool how welcoming they all are. Like I, I've just, I've always appreciated interacting with, with all those guys. Like they're all good people. Yeah, man. It's cool. Um, so you, so were you in Toronto at the time when you went down to Boston? Yeah, yeah. So it was. I, I've told this story um, uh, other times, but um, I was living in Toronto and I was having a really hard time being in Toronto. I was um, not in a good place, like headspace wise. And, uh, you know, the Boston trip in a way kind of like saved my life a little bit because um, I was kind of like at a point where I was just ready to like, you know, end things. And then uh, I saw that Jason was doing this thing and I'm like, well, you know, whatever, one last trip before I put a pin in it kind of thing. And I was like, you know, who cares about the money because it'll just go on a credit card and, you know, (laughs) try and get money out of a dead guy kind of thing. Um, But then like that trip was amazing. Like getting to hang out with, with Jason was really cool. But the friendship I made with Armand was like um, a turning point for me because like the Armand, um, he introduced me to the Instant Film Society and started getting more involved mm-hmm. with that. And then the community and the kinship I found through all of that, uh, like through the Instant Film Society, through Armand, through through Jason and everything, really turned things around for me. And, um, you know, it made a, made a huge difference. Like, um, you know, the, the Boston trip in a way was like kind of a lifesaver. Because I've had wow, a few of those like moments where it's like when I was a kid, I was in a bad space, and it's like punk music saved my life. And then, you know, same with me. Yeah, yeah punk rock. Music. Yeah, straight up. I mean, you know, I was in a. It sounds so bad, but like growing up in the Midwest, everybody hates growing up in the Midwest. Like we all hated it. Like all my friends hated it. Like it's like, and there's so many reasons why. Maybe because we all grew up in small towns, and we think the grass is greener on the other side. What a you know whatever, but. Punk rock music. I mean, I went to a private Catholic school, and punk rock music like opened up my entire world. I mean, I you know, my entire world changed because of that. Yeah, yeah, it, yep. it saved then, so many people. Yeah, and, and honestly, film photography, you know, to a similar extent, like I like I say, like you know, I kind of played it off like it was like small little turbulent ups and downs of life, but I, you know, some real hardcore life shit happened to me kind of around the same time and thank God for photography, man. You know, <laughs> it's just, it, cause it, cause what it does is it, it gets you interacting with people with similar passions and honestly, a lot of them hold similar passions outside of photography that I do as well. You know what I mean? I have a similar mindset and, and, and they're easy to talk to, you know, and, and it was all an intro to these people through, a shared interest in photography. So, 
it's it's such a powerful community and just even Mm -hmm. as a hobby it's a cool thing and um like that's what one of the things that always drew me into jason's work especially after i started digging into it more was like his road trip stuff like a plain view is is one of my most favorite um photo books that i have because like it's really good man it, it's so good and like you know i i haven't spent a lot of time in texas but like looking at the way that he framed those photos it just reminded me of road trips when i was a kid in western canada because, you know, if you didn't know that that book was exclusively Texas, like a lot of those photos could look like they could have been like dick hole anywhere in North America kind of stuff. Sure. And um, so it's like that that kind of like, you know, touched me a bit where I was like, I want to do this kind of shit. Like, and I think it's important to like capture this kind of stuff because who knows, like stuff from a plain view is probably not going to be around like, you know, five, ten years from now. Yeah. I mean, I think Eggleston is a guy that, like, I see parallels with that kind of work, too, where he, he will go back. Just Jason goes back. I go back to the same places, you know what I mean, all the time that I used to shoot. And you do. You see the degradation, and it doesn't take long. You know, when nature wants to take something over that's been abandoned, it's gone, and it goes quick, and it changes quickly. Um, and man tears it down, too, from time to time. <laughs> it depends on where it's at, but... Like, one thing that I really enjoy, just to kind of ex- explore what we were just talking about as far as, like, it could be Texas or it could be Western Canada. Well, it, it, can, be, it can be Central Eastern California. Yeah. It could be Iowa, Kansas. They, there's so many rural places in the North America area, and it seems like it's very similar throughout, you know, so much agriculture, so many dark, dusty, dirty roads, and just, you know, you get off those big interstates, and those little towns could literally be in any state, it feels like, you know, it's and, and, and up in Canada. That's a place, man, I got to tell you, I took a huge road trip, oh, I don't know, five years ago maybe, and we went all the way up to the Yukon from San Francisco. Holy shit. And camped and, and road trip and stuff. Beautiful, bro. Like, just unbelievable. Unbelievable country. Like, we fell in love with Canada. Alaska was cool. We went to Alaska and stuff, but Canada's rad. I cannot wait to explore your country more. It is really cool, man. Well, if you're ever in Vancouver, let me know. I'd be happy to show you around. Straight up. And and that'll be... Isn't there... Is there workshops that are somewhere around Vancouver? There's a... I'm blanking right now. This stinks. Um... There is a Instagram crew I follow, and they they're always posting like they do workshops on an island somewhere near oh, Vancouver. Yeah, probably in Victoria. There's like Vancouver Island, which is close by. Yeah, so cool, man! Like, and, and like some of the photographers that are part of the workshop, like they'll they'll like bring some star photographer in, and they'll like do the workshop with them. Really neat stuff, like really, really cool. I wish I wasn't blanking right now, and I'm not going to try to look it up or think about it too hard, but um, that's another thing. There's, like, so many resources out there, too, like, through whether it be social media or just talking to friends about, like, uh, you know, just, like, different possibilities through workshops or shows. You know, I see people posting, like, hey, like, send your work in, and, and maybe we'll select you, you know, to be part of, like, this group show or you know, enter your work in and, and get it, like, have this jury of photographers, you know, critique your work. So I find that exciting, you know what I mean? Like, I don't think I've ever really been part of a, a collective group that does stuff like that, you know, or, like, that has that kind of interest in it, you know? Was it Shawnee and Lake? Was that the, the one you were hearing about? No. Hmm. It's funny. I, I really am blanking on it, man. It. I, I can't say, I don't know if it's um, all format collective used to do stuff. I, I don't think so. I, I, I honestly, I can't remember. Really. I'm sorry, man. I'm blanking, but it was something like, it was something Island they, and, okay. and they would have worked. I mean, honestly, it's horrible podcast guests right now. I mean, I bring something <laughs> up and I have no greater that. 
it's but all, it's anyway, all it does just prove that my point though, that there's like, you can get involved, man. You can really go for it. You know, like, um, you know, one thing I want to do here in Iowa now that I'm back is, you know, and, and I, for a long time, I felt like oh, I would never do that because so many other people do this, but like try to get people involved in this, whether they just see this like kind of gimmicky one time thing, but I would love to have like a little gallery space in high school. I used to frame pictures for a, gallery, a local gallery in the same town I live in now. And, uh, um, I want to get back into that. I want to start framing pictures again, sort of like a little gallery here in my town. And then I was thinking, well, that'd be really cool to like rent out film cameras and process film and, and sell some film cameras and, and do little workshops for, you know, uh, cause I'm also trying to volunteer for my local, um, little museum here, um, in the archives. And so I thought, boy, that'd be really an interesting thing. Like have another program for kids to do in the summer, like just learn film stock here or adults, you know, get a little wine involved or something. And, and I don't know. I, I think it'd be kind of cool to kind of spread the word around little old Iowa here. So that's the goal. That that's where be. I'm at right now. I, I love and, the but, sound. But I, would, I wouldn't think about putting myself out like that if other people weren't doing that too, you know? And that's what's, that's kind of what's kept me to, on Instagram. Is it, it is inspirational if you can find your, the people you want to follow anymore. It's tough. You see a bunch of crap you don't want to follow or know about, but if you if you're diligent about it and you and you search out the people you care about, like people are doing cool stuff, man, and it's and it is inspirational, you know. It, it is true. Like I, I've had a storied history with with Instagram and. Um, for the most part, it's been positive, but that's only because in the last like five, six years, I've changed how I interact with Instagram. Like I've been using it since 2011 and I used to have a toxic relationship with it that, you know, wasn't healthy. Like a lot of people do. Um, but you know, this would have never happened if it wasn't for Instagram and, uh, I wouldn't have been able to talk to like so many interesting folks if, if it wasn't for, for Instagram. So there, there's good things that come out of it. It's so funny to say that, right, about a social media thing, but it's so true. Like, I would never know anybody that I know now, like, that, that are involved in the – I probably wouldn't be shooting photos right now, you know? Like, I, who knows? Maybe. Maybe I would. Like I say, it's always sort of been, like, on the peripheral for me, but um, I don't know, man. Like, it's inspirational to me just to see people's work all the time, you know? I mean, you can do it where it's like – a competitive thing and, and you feel like you have to keep up and every, you know, Oh, look at all that. Look at that person's doing. Well, that's you. That's on you. You know? Yeah. Like that's just sharing what they're doing. You know, like if, if like, I like to, to get inspired by what other people are shooting, you know? And like, Oh, what, you know, interesting, interesting thought on that subject matter, you know, or I wouldn't have shot it from that angle or, you know, or that close or, or maybe even that far away or, you know? Um, and so that, that's been kind of like how I've approached it. Cause of course there's so many times where I'm like, Ugh, I can't take this anymore. You know, I can't take caring and looking at this all the time, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, there's times when I post less or I, I stop looking at it, but more than not, People are doing cool shit and it hypes me up, you know. <laughs> there there so. is lots of cool shit there. And like, you know, I'm I'm I've been going through a bit of a lull myself where um I haven't been feeling super creative and haven't really felt enticed to share much of anything or like feel like it's interesting at all. So the only thing that's been keeping me on the Instagram lately is just the chat. Um but mm -hmm. know, it's I, I kind of like Jason's approach to where like he, he ducks off for like months at a time and then he'll like pop up yeah. when he needs to do something and then he like drops off again and if it wasn't for the chat i would probably like do that i would deactivate for a bit while i'm just like you know not feeling super creative but on the same token i'm also very grateful to be able to have this platform and, and chat with people and um mm -hmm. you know you have a, a love for polaroid and pack film and things like that have you ever um thought about going down to uh, a polacon uh in denton 
Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when they had it in Texas, I wanted to go to that really bad. I just couldn't couldn't get it done. Um, but my life has changed so much. I have a little bit more time on my hands, and and it's definitely going to be in the works sooner than later. I'd love to do it. Is it? They had one in San Francisco. I went to that one. So they they've uh, changed it up a little bit. So historically and traditionally, the official Policon happens in Denton, Texas. Um, but Brian Brooks uh, from the Bay Area Photography uh, well, Peeps, he he came to Policon 3 and he basically said, I like what you guys got here. You should do mm-hmm. one in San Francisco or I'm just going to steal your idea and do it anyway. So it's like you can be part of it or not, but it's going to happen. <laughs> that sounds like Brian. He's such a cool dude, man. He's a really cool dude. Oh, he's he's the greatest of all time. I fucking love Brian. He's one of my favorite people. Um, I miss him. Super talented. So, so talented. talented. And just, like, so kind. Yeah. Like, it's... Yeah, another guy wants people involved. Another guy that wants stuff going on. You know? It's really right. Absolutely. Yeah, he just wants to get people involved. He just wants people to have a good time. And, uh, yeah, just a really, really awesome dude. Um if you get a chance, you should come down this year. Um, it's the last weekend of September. Of September? Yeah. And it's going to be in Denton? Yes, sir. Okay. And you're going to be there? Yeah. Ar- Armand and I have been talking about uh, maybe driving. Because so, I was looking at flights, and like airlines are all fucked right now. And, um, Girl, I, can't even, I can't even imagine trying yeah. to fly right now. Well, in, in like, you know, our, our national carrier, Air Canada, just announced that they're, like, shutting down, like, 200 flights a day just because they can't handle it. And so, mm-hmm. naturally, like, prices are going to go up, which they, they did when I was looking at, like, you know, what it was going to cost to go to Denton. It was going to be, like, 1200 bucks when, you know, the last time I went, it was, like, six 700 Um And I was like, well, fuck, if it's going to be that much money, I may as well just drive down. So, yeah. Um, Armand's thinking about like flying up to Washington, maybe like Bellingham or Seattle or something. I'll pick him up there and he'll drive down with me, uh, to, uh, to Texas. So I have some company one way. Um, so yeah, I think we're, we're going to do that. Sounds like an awesome man. Great photo trip. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I'm just going to, I'm going to take two weeks off. And so it'll probably be about when I was looking at maps, it's about three or four days to get from Vancouver to Denton. Um, sure. and spend a few days there and then just like take my time on the way back. Oh, that sounds amazing. And, and all the cool stuff you can see along the way. I mean, I don't know what route you would take, but Oh, there's such great, just, I think I used this word before, but detritus There's just so much just laying around and to look at and, and beautiful landscapes. And I, I love, I love that whole area. Like I've spent a lot of time now, like along what is it? The 40, I think I've taken. Um, and that goes clear through Texas, I believe. It's so cool. It's such a neat area. I actually, you know, it's really pathetic, but I was in Austin and met up with those guys to go to a, a motorcycle race. And I did not get to Denton. I have not gotten to see, I've not experienced Denton camera exchange yet. Seriously? Which I, it's so sad, I know. So I really should uh, make the voyage and do it, meet up with you guys. That'd be so fun. Dude, absolutely. Yeah, so it's it's a 34-hour drive from Vancouver to Denton. Oh, so great. Um, and it, Honestly, like, why, you know, when it used to be convenient, of course, it makes complete sense. But when you, they price this all out and it's not convenient at all and it's like torture to fly... Man, there's nothing like a good old road trip, you know, especially because you don't have to worry about your film being scanned. You can take, you know, all the cameras your heart desires as much as you can fit in your vehicle. It's just the best. Man. Well, and that's kind of the thought with it because, like, I was thinking of taking the 4 by 5 down, and then I've been talking to Daniel about doing an episode of the chat there because the first year I went to, to Policon, um, Brandy, um, I can't remember the person she used to do the chat with, but um, they used to do a photography podcast and they did a live <clears throat> um, recording at Policon, which was cool. And um, you know, cool. forever on the internet, there's a, a clip of me saying that I wanted to hunt down all the Fuji executives that decided to kill pack film and I was going to line them all up in a row and teabag them individually for their crimes against photography. 
What a weird deal. That, yeah, that's ugh. yeah. That's a hard time to think about because it's tough. You know, like if ever there was a more deserving crew to get tea baked individually, it would be them. I mean, yeah. they're <laughs> why? I just don't understand why. Like, I don't understand why to just let it die. So the the story that I heard was it wasn't that it wasn't profitable. They were making plenty of money off of pack film. But the reason they decided to get rid of pack film uh, was because they did an assessment and discovered that for what they were spending, um, or sorry, for the same amount of factory space that it was taking them to do um, pack film, if they use that same amount of space for uh, packaging cosmetics, they could make more money. So they stripped down that uh, factory, converted it all to uh, to doing cosmetics, and then that's uh, that's why we don't have pack film. Apparently, that's the story I've heard. But to, to just keep it away from you, know what I mean, like to not. I get it, money. Okay, not a huge surprise. Okay, that's fine. Make your money. Do your thing. Do whatever you want to do. You know, make horrible products or do whatever you need to do. But what I don't understand is like to then not give or sell the technology or per, you know what I mean. I don't understand like why you just like no, we're not going to tell anybody how we did it. We're not going to give anybody the the you know uh, machines or any of the uh, um, you know hard goods that produce these items and we're just going to let it all die. We're going to tear it all out, throw it away. Well, the machines don't exist anymore. So they apparently retrofitted all the pack film machines to package cosmetics. Um, designs are out there, but the other par- problem is like there's a technical deficit of people that know how to like build and operate those machines. Th- those people sure. either are too old to do it or are dead now, uh, which is like, double sad like that's also i when i was talking to phil steble from the darkroom lab he was talking mm-hmm. about like that's why we don't have new um yeah i like that <laughs> um yeah. he, he was saying like that's why we don't have new film slr cameras is no one really has the ability to make shutters properly for those kinds of cameras because we we lost that technical ability isn't that funny because like back in the day like these great cameras, you know, that we all still love and enjoy. It, it just kind of breaks my heart because had we just like kept being able to do that, think of where these film cameras could be today. You know what I mean? Like just like the amount of like technology and we're supposed to be so more, much more advanced yet people don't know how to do what people used to know how to do. You know? <laughs> it's just kind of funny to me. It's like, that's why we can't make, pack film cameras because you can't figure it out what the hell are you talking about I mean, like, I'm talking to you and you're in Canada right now. I'm seeing you face to face you're like you know basically in the same room, but they can't figure it out like give me a break like but I, I don't know even even the thing I mean I'm that, an idiot well I, I wouldn't say you're an idiot but, like I'm, I'm sure that uh, you know you're, you're technology I am but like all these wizards out there come on wizards make make the film again do something like that I don't know the, the the thing is though, I think we're running out of wizards, and they've been replaced with like charlatans and ass hats, and like e- even the internet. So it's like we have this amazing moment to be able to be talking face to face, like you know, future technology. Um, you know, it's not quite hoverboards and Star Trek, but you know, it's yeah. it's better than like long distance phone calls with AT and T. Um, all the infrastructure though that we're using right now is ancient and held together with yeah. duct tape and bailing wire. And like that's something that a lot of people don't understand about the internet is it's not this amazing robust thing that is like, you know, infallible. It's kind of like three kids in a coat sharing your messages all over the world. And you know, that's a great way to put it. It could be very easily destroyed and we could like lose everything. Um, but they don't really want people to know that because they don't want people to panic. But it's just you know, working in IT and like you know, learning some of the things I have. I'm just like you know, it's it's amazing, but it's also like holy shit! Like we're not really strengthening it up a lot. We're just kind of like 
tacking more and more and more on this stuff that like really has its underpinnings in projects that started in the fifties and sixties. Hmm. Well, that's why I, we just all have to learn how to make our own plate now. Yeah. You know, just, just make your own plate and then do, um, and then hand color them. You know, that'll be our color film now. That would be kind of wild. It's <laughs> Dude, how about, have you, do you follow this Potter? No, you should send me their um, their thing. I'll check it out. Yeah, Liz is cool. She's a Texas shooter, and she, um, I don't know, like, I followed her for a little while, and she started hand, um, like, coloring her black and white panoramic can- uh, sh- shots. And it's unbelievable. I mean, it's beautiful. It's dreamy. You know, it's really cool. So, yeah. I, I was just looking on, on uh, Google Maps here on, on the, the computer machine, and uh, it looks like the trip, the route it's recommending is going through Washington, up into Idaho, across Idaho, into Montana, and then Ooh. dipping through Montana into whatever is between Montana and Colorado, into Denver. And then through mm-hmm. through Colorado, into the tip of Oklahoma, and then into Texas, and shooting down. Yeah, across. that's it's like the Panhandle of Oklahoma. That's a super cool area too. Will, you, will it take you to Kansas at all? Uh, no, no. It's so there. There is another route that's. You know, it's only like an hour longer, that um, dips across uh, Montana into South Dakota, um, yeah. through Nebraska. Under, and then kind of a cesspool of the government, but, but cool stuff to look at. Yeah. And then that, that route takes you through Wichita. It doesn't, it doesn't quite hit Kansas, but you know, I, I, I have bad memories about Kansas. So I'm not really super keen on going back there, but Man, I gotta be honest. We just recently went, there's a, uh, so we have a 94 toy land cruiser that we're trying to restore a little bit. And we found this, like, literally in the middle of nowhere town in Kansas, like, and they even live on the outskirts of that. This this guy who his whole family runs this, like, Toyota Land Cruiser-specific restoration company. And so we just recently road tripped down there to drop the Land Cruiser off and then kind of piddled around, looked around Kansas does not disappoint if you ever do get a chance. It's like Texas. There's like so many weird ass cool things to see <laughs> to see in those states, man. Yeah, like I, I've been to Kansas City and um, mm-hmm. dipped through Kansas City, um, and then took back roads down through um, <clears throat> Missouri um, to go to Tulsa. Uh, for Jason's yeah. uh, opening of uh, his his Oklahoma photos, and uh, one of my best also now, man, Tulsa is a cool spot. Tulsa is very cool. cool. I, I like Tulsa mm-hmm. a lot. Like it's it's a it's oh, a cool space. Tulsa's got so much cool stuff going on now. This thing. Yeah, the Philbrook Museum there is fucking amazing. They're doing all sorts of cool shit, and so you went to that too. Yeah. I was so bummed to not be able to go. I gotta stop saying that, man. I just gotta start going, you know. Yeah, just just <laughs> head out, man. Um, I, I was I was bummed to miss Galveston, um, because I was gonna go yeah. check out the Galveston one, but travel restrictions were still not great, and I didn't really want to fuck around with uh, the the whole testing thing and all that. Testing requirements are all gone now, but um, yeah, I, I really wanted to make it down <laughs> for Galveston. Yeah, that, I mean, another completely unique spot to go look around at. You know what I mean? Like, I've never been to Galveston. I've never even thought about going to Galveston. But, you know, now I have this great insight to Galveston through Jason's work. You know, it's so neat. It's really cool. Yeah, the, the book is fantastic. Like, it's such a cool book. And mm-hmm. I can't wait for the Oklahoma book to come out because those Oklahoma photos he did were stunning. And, uh, yeah, they are. Yeah. The work that Steve did with like the printing and framing also amazing. Like I bet. Yeah. It, it was cool. Yeah. Well, like, I mean, 
I always bug him and, and tell him, like, it's just constant inspiration. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, like, I'm, so he hooked me up with this guy named Dave Wood from DR5. Okay. Are you familiar with DR5? So he used DR5 for a ton of his black and white work. Yeah. That man's a wizard. Yeah, he's, he's, shut, he's shutting it down, though, which is sad. He is, man, because it's just, you know, everybody, it's so hard to sustain. Because, I mean, honestly, going to visit his wizard shop, literally, I can't stop saying it. The man is, is he's so smart. I mean, he's a scientist first and an amazing photographer as well. And the work he's producing right now is super, super cool. But I've now gotten, because now I live in Iowa, he lives in this town called Stewart, Iowa. Super small town, but it's right outside of Des Moines, okay. which is still a small town, but it at least has an airport, you know. So he's positioned really well to, like, be able to travel and work and whatnot. Um, and he bought this beautiful old Masonic temple building, gorgeous old building. And he does his wizardry in the basement, and, and he has this custom made machine that dunk like all this technology that he can do everything on a mass scale. And he just doesn't have anybody sending him negative you know, or sending him film. So it's like, how do you, cause you can't, you know, how it was explained to me is basically you can't let the chemicals just sit. Yeah. Or they, yeah. and so what do you do? You know, <clears throat> Especially, you know how everything's more expensive. You know, plywood is expensive. I just experienced that today. Let alone chemicals. You know, I mean, it's gone up like five, ten times on it. And it's just so hard for him to sustain that, you know? Let alone, like, try to, like, boost interest when you have to raise prices. It's super tough. But, I mean, just being able to get some of my work done through DR5 now and just to meet the man behind it, just, it and, and his partner, Barbara, they're just great people. I mean, great photographers again, but I wouldn't know them if it weren't for Jason and I wouldn't know Jason if it weren't for Instagram. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it kind of all kind of comes back to this, like, you know, it's where you find inspiration. And, and I've been, you know, so lucky just through his work, but then also the people he's connected me with, you know, like, I wouldn't know you did. You know what I mean? Like that's true. That's you know, and 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 get to listen to all your great work that you're doing. You know, because you. like podcasts, like so, like again, I still own a window cleaning company. Um, and what do I do all day? Put the earbuds in and just clean windows and listen to photo talk. It's the best. You know, it's just the best. And so, and it's super inspirational like the work that you do and everyone that is, are producing these photo podcasts. I love all the work, you know, and, but a lot of it I found out through Instagram, man. And I wouldn't find out it uh, any other way, you know, than maybe word of mouth, but that's, that's less and less these days. So I don't know. This whole thing exists because of Instagram too, like for, for mine anyways, um, because it, it just happened as a, I was stuck in my apartment during lockdown in Toronto and I saw these other people doing these live things and I'm like, what the fuck is this live thing? And so I would just like be cooking dinner and I turn the live on and then, you know, people just start asking me like photo questions and then they were just like, you should just do a photo thing. And that was three years ago now. And, um, I still have no idea what the fuck I'm doing with this thing. Um, you're easy to talk to man. Pretty great. What is this? Oh, uh, oh I... so I do have an audio only version of the podcast. It's already out there, Paul. If you go on Spotify, Apple, Audible, all of the different things, uh, just search photography chat with Merlin and all of the episodes are up there. Um, I got this fancy pantsy road soundboard that records the audio as well, too. So I saw some uh, comments that the audio on Instagram was terrible. Um, the audio on the podcast will not be terrible because it comes straight out of the recording thing. So, I mean, come on, Paul, you don't want to see us, man. What's, what's the deal? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I, I look all like I'm stoned out of my mind right now because I haven't been sleeping well. Dude, I'm, I'm so jealous of the beard. Have you ever, uh, 
listened to a band or heard of a band called uh, Psycho Stick? No. Oh man. <laughs> They're like no. this this ridiculous like metal band that does all of these like uh fucking just corny corny so they did a tribute to Bruce Campbell and they actually got Bruce Campbell to be in the music video. Um they oh, did God. a cover of Let the Bodies Hit the Floor, but it was like I can only count to four. <laughs> yeah. Um so they're, they, they're fun. They're they're a lot of fun and uh, they do live streams all the time, so it's like when they could no longer tour. They were like, holy shit, how are we going to make money? And then they decided to just do virtual concerts. <clears throat> sure. So they set up a really cool platform like through Twitch and Patreon and like all this stuff where they do like full on like concerts online and people just, you know, send them tips or whatever. And they've managed to like turn that into like the same as what it cost them when they were touring, like for what they were making. Yeah. But now they never have to leave their garage, which is kind of cool. Right. But why I mentioned them? I mean, I guess to the for the convenience of it all, maybe. But I can't imagine not like interacting with the crowd. You know what I mean? I'm I'm sure they'll get out to regular touring again at some point because there is something magical uh, about like playing in front of a group of people. Like, yeah, you know, I haven't done it since t- 2008, but um, I miss that shit. Like, there's there's like a magic when you see all those people having a good time, and it's because you're doing yeah. stuff. And the, just the collective energy of a crowd, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. You know, like being in the crowd, I'm, I'm, I'm on that side of things. I just am a crowd member, but like, it's just, it's amazing, you know, like getting that energy from, from a collective experience together, you know? So it's something I haven't been to in a long time, man. I haven't gone to live music in a long time. In fact, it's kind of funny that we're talking right now. So July 4th will be one year my one year anniversary of being back in Iowa and we missed it last year because it was like the day before I believe. And on the fourth was the Saturday, but we right by at my new, like where we live now is this park and there is a free show, a free concert. And there's like, I don't know, 10 or 12 musicians that are, you know, bands and stuff that are playing. But like I've seen BB King play my little park here Whoa. when he was alive and still playing, and that was a very long time ago. But I think starting the parks now, this is like the thirtieth, thirty-first year of this like free free concert series they do, and it's it's always in and around July fourth, and this year it's the second. And so we're preparing because like pretty soon there's gonna be like thirty thousand people in my neighborhood. Oh, holy and shit. at that park and so this will be the, i get to see live music man in a long time it's kind of fun so well, that'd be fun you'll have and to tell honestly, me honestly man when you i will when you sent me the uh the you do a great job with your like all your graphics and stuff and like showcasing the uh guest photos and stuff so i want to give you a thumbs up on that but when you was when you sent it to me i was like oh my god man i was in back of my house here setting up a stage because I'm also having a band play at my house that day. And so I was like doing all this work. I'm like, Oh my God, I got a shower. I got, I'm not going to be able to, I can't blow Merlin off. What am I doing? So it was like a mad dash, bro. But like, I'm so happy we connected because I don't know. I've been looking forward to this since you asked me. I, I mean, I'm tickled. Man. I'm, I'm honored to be on your show. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have you on the show and like, you know, it's I. That's cool that um, you're gonna have a, a stage in the back. Like live music is such an amazing thing, and it's it's something that I've missed so much um, through yeah. this whole pandemic. Well, so many of us have. Like it's just. I know, you know. man. Oh. I know, and it's funny too because like I'm still like I don't know like even a year being outside of California. Like when we were in San Francisco, we were so cautious. Like so, my my girlfriend, she's a teacher. And I'm a small business owner, so, like, I shut down for a long time. She worked remotely for years, and it was just, like, really gnarly. And we we did everything we could to just stay good, you know. And and now that we're back, like, you know, my parents are in their 70s. Well, my dad's in his 70s. My mom's in her 60s. And it's, like, you just got to keep your family safe and stuff, you know. So, like, we're still pretty cautious, but, like, 
the numbers are really low, luckily here in Iowa somehow. And, um, it's just funny that like still the thought of going to a cramped small venue with a bunch of people, I don't know, man, I'm still like freaked out about it a little bit. So it's nice that my first like foray back into it is going to be out of the, in other words. So I'm excited about it. I, I was in Nashville, um, a month and a half ago for a big work event what? and, um, it was a little nerve wracking because I was like bracing myself for it being like, this is probably where I'm finally going to get COVID from. Um, cause like, you know, Nashville's been known for like COVID basically hasn't existed there for the whole pandemic. Cause it's like, if you ignore it hard enough, it just goes away. Right. Um, but it was, kind of, it, it was super wild because like we, we went to some like bars and stuff downtown, like, you know, no one's masking. And it was like, if you wear a mask, everyone like looks at you funny. So you're just like, you know, you appear pressured into like not doing it. And then you're like, Oh my God, we're all raw dog in the air right now in the middle of a pandemic still. Oh shit. Um, there was like a few thousand people that went to this conference that I was part of and something like 38% of the folks that went ended up catching COVID Two people. I was in close proximity with caught it, but I didn't get it nor any of my other teammates. And we were like, how did we not get it? That's super weird because like we were like with those people and it's just weird. I know. It feels like a mystery a little bit, you know, like, and that's, just, I guess what, you know, freaked us out and still does a little bit. It's like, it is so like, to my knowledge, I've not ever had it. I mean, I lived in Iowa for a year and no one masks here at all. Like, it's not, nothing, no, nowhere, none. I mean, maybe once or twice a month I may see somebody with a mask. And it's just, uh, I don't know, man, somehow stayed healthy. I don't, I don't know. I mean, not to dive down that. I mean, fucking talking about COVID so weird all. It, it's, well, but we all, it's one of those all collectively experienced together, you know? It's like one of those rare moments where everybody had to deal with it, whether they wanted to or not, you know? Well, and then there's, like, new weird stuff coming up, too, because, like, now apparently polio is making uh, a resurgence because of vaccination gaps. Polio? So, yeah, so polio you is bad. polio is? Yeah. Sick. Cool, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's uh. just... We not only are we like going back into the dark ages with like you know women's rights and all that kind of stuff to you, but all those old viruses are coming back too for like another round. Being like, you know what? I think you need a crooked spine. Let's let's uh, let's fix that up for you. Yeah, you, you thought COVID was fun. Let's bring out some of the greatest hits. You know what I mean? <laughs> bring polio back. Fuck. Yeah, what exactly. a real deal. I mean, that maybe it's because I'm in a little tunnel over here, but I don't know, man. Like it's. It's, it is weird. I, I don't know if I've never felt this kind of energy in my country anyway, you know, like it's intense, man. It's really intense. It's, it's a weird energy cause it's, it's a bit scary and exhausting and, um, yeah, just like do what you can to be safe out there and like, you know, spend time with people you care and love about and support them. Is, is like all we really can do right now. Um, this brings me back though. How great is it that we have photography to dwell on? You know what I mean? Like we could, you know, it's so easy to get down these like holes of like, ah, fucking everything sucks. Everything's horrible. Like what a mess politically, what a mess health wise. No one knows what they're doing. And all I have to worry about is this, you know what I mean? Or, or this. That's all I care about. You know what I mean? Like I get to, I get to like take my focus away from the hell news that day and, and get to focus on a passion. Just wait, wait a yeah. sec. Sorry. Did, did you just what like, did you just casually whip out an X pan? It, I, it's not an X pan, bro. Okay. It, it, X, it, it's the X pan's, uh, best friend, the Fuji TX one. Um, I'm to understand that Fuji and Hasselblad joined forces to make these cameras and they shared technology and information with each other. And this, I actually got for my road trip to the Yukon. Oh, wow. That's why I got this. And it was cool, man. I got some cute, like the image, the images of this camera. And it's the same camera as the Hasselblad, the same yeah. thing. 
It's just not painted black. And uh, I I love this camera. It is funny though. Like I've, you know how many times I I just like hashtag Fuji TX1, and people are like, "What is it, man? Is it a digital or is it film? Why are you putting the Fuji camera on there? Is it film or is it digital? It's one or the other. It can't be both." I'm like, just pump the brakes, you know? Geez, Louise, it, it is a film camera, you know? That's just what it's called. Some people just get so, worried about that kind of shit, though. Like, Whatever. I love the camera, though. And, and it's funny, though, like, I bought it because it has the, I mean, it's a true panoramic camera, um, as you can tell by its beautiful size. But there's a really cool option where you can just switch it back, and then it covers up most of the frames to be like 35 millimeter format again. And it's such a cool camera. It's basically like, it's, it's like my substitute for a Leica M6 basically. Cause it, it has like beautiful, just bright screen. It's got in-house metering. It's just a beautiful, beautiful rangefinder camera. I love it. I absolutely love it. But see, I get to dwell on that instead of like worrying about COVID numbers. <laughs> Cause I do that too, but then I, then I get to go back to like, okay, now you can refocus since I've had my panic attacks for the day over, you know, what's going on in the world. I, I have a passion and it's just such a wonderful passion to have, you know, photography is so cool. It's such a neat thing. It, it's, it is a very cool passion and it's also like a really powerful tool to like connect and to document and to like just preserve uh, things out there. Um, so yeah. It's, you know, it's, it's been cool to get to know more about you and dude, you should really try to come down to Policon this year. I will. I really will. Um, now that I, cause I thought I missed it. Wasn't there one in San Francisco already? Yeah. Didn't so, they do one? uh, the Bay area one happens in March and then, um, gotcha. Policon proper happens, uh, last weekend of, uh, September. It, it lines up every year with when they open up the Texas state fair. Oh, cool. Uh, and then I got to give a, because you just said that you were in um, uh, Nashville. A friend of mine, I actually started helping her a little bit. I need to be more of more help to her, but she does a, like, it, it's not just a photo show, but it's like photo, um, painters, music, and she does it at the Dive Motel. And it's for Halloween and it's a big art show. And so I'm helping curate that now with her. That's cool. And so if you ever make, probably not this year, but if you ever can swing a Halloween trip, it is such a blast. And this is number two. So we're going to keep this thing going, but it's, it's it, she even has like uh, independent filmmakers have their shorts, short films showing during it. It was, it was a real blast. It was a, it was a really good time. That's so awesome. if you ever find a way to Nashville uh, over uh, Halloween, highly suggest coming and I'll give you more information about that. I'll just bug you and send you stuff, send you the show flyer, whether you can make it or not, whatever. But it's fun, man. I mean, that's another thing like putting shows on being part of shows. Like how cool is that? You know, like it's just such a unique thing. I never thought I'd show my work, you know, I'm so happy. It, it is a really cool thing. Like I, I just put together um, a group show um, two months ago of some of my work and some friends work in Toronto. And uh, there's a, a book out of it right now, of like what all the photos were in, in the show and everything. But um, it was a lot of fun to like do a group show. And it was like, you know, first one I've been part of since the pandemic. So it was like, yeah. need, need to see my pals and like see their pals come out and like, you know, be stoked about their work and everything. And, um, mm-hmm. Jason Moore and I were talking about maybe doing a show in Vancouver of like Instagram photographers. Um, <laughs> so even if they couldn't make it out, just like find somewhere where we could like, you know, have their, their work up, like maybe even just use my studio. Um, Ooh, but that's something we've been like toying around with for, for an idea. And you said Jason Moore? Yeah. Solid dude. Another solid human being. Like, Such a so good cool. Yeah. I got to give another shout. So we actually, um, we were bummed that 
Jason couldn't make it out, but he was had other engagements, and I think it was I think it had something to do with his work being shown. It could have been the Philbrook, I can't remember. But um, Matt, do you know Matt? Um, he he lives up. I think it's sort of where does he live again? I can't remember. A little north of San Francisco. Um, but he and I put on a show in San Francisco. And, and Jason was kind enough to let us use the film photographic kind of monitor, you know, like logos and stuff for it. It was, it was sort of like a little tiny film photographic slash, you know, just Northern California shooters. And like Bob was part of it and, and all these dudes that are up in, in Northern California. But my friend Michelle Killfeather, do you, do you follow her at all, Michelle Killfeather? No, I have to look her up. You re- She's amazing, dude. And she actually, during the reason I brought up that little show uh, that we did uh, was because um, Michelle got an idea. She helped us, like, hang the show and stuff. And it was actually a really great turnout. I called it a little show. I was very proud of it. There was, like, hundreds of people there. We were blown away by it. Um, and anyway, uh, COVID happened, and Michelle's like, hey, let's do an outside projected show. So she projected photographs on the side of a building and everybody was just outside. And it, it was so cool, man. I mean, it was just one of those things. So I was able to be a part of that too. And I was just like, holy smokes, you know, like what a great idea. Cause we were all down. Like you couldn't show work. You couldn't be part of the community. And then all of a sudden she's like, no way we'll do it outside. We'll just project it on a wall. You know, That's again, cool. it's just creative doing cool stuff. You know, she's, she's an awesome shooter too. Um, she kind of has a painterly quality because she used to be a painter. So her perspective is really interesting. She's a really great, great eye for sure. That's really awesome cool. Shooter. You uh, send, okay. send me her profile so I can check it out. I want to, I want to see your stuff. I, I, for sure. And I don't know why I'm blanking right now on that handle. Do you know who I'm talking about? No, I, don't, I don't think I've met Matt. Matt Burt. No, I, I Matt, met Matt. He's such a solid dude. He's another one of those guys. I met him because of through film photographic and Jason and stuff. He was such a great inspiration when I was up in Northern California and we, he and I kept in touch and like are still homies and he is just such a good dude, such a good guy. I'll send you his information too. Um, and then, uh, Bob, Bob Price from photo filming. He's a solid dude. He was another Northern California guy, but that show was really cool, man. And it was just like, again, just inspired by what other people are doing. So it's like, we should do this, you know, why not us, you know? And that's so, that's the fun of it, you know? That's right. I love it. Yeah, man. Well, dude, I, but I love that. You know, was Jason your first guest? Jason Moore? Um, yes, Jason was. Yeah. That was such a treat. I remember looking back through these and I went and watched his. It was so cool. Listen to his podcast. It was great, man. Jason's he's such a nice guy, isn't he? Uh, he's, he's a super nice guy. And, um, yeah, I, he's, he's been on a couple of times. And um, we still have not actually met in person yet. But um, we've talked about, oh, really? yeah, and like that's the thing that's kind of wild with like the, the Instagrams and stuff is just, um, you know, there's all these people that I've built these really great connections with, but I still have yet to like meet them in person. I know, man. I mean, that's exactly right. Like, obviously, you and I've never met in person. Maybe Policon. Yeah, uh, we will. Um, you, that really just struck a chord. I mean, uh, there's no way I can't be able to make that. That'd be really fun. Because um, Texas is like, it's a little ways, but it's not a horrible drive for me. I just shoot straight down, you know? Yeah. So I think it's like 12 hours or something. Yeah, Big just deal. some cool stuff along the way. That's doable. Um, what, uh, you got anything going right now project-wise? Um, you put, have you put any Yeah, I've put a couple of books out. So um, I've got three that I've done so far. Um, one of them was like a, a, a volumed release. So I, I did... I'm going to be doing a second edition of that here soon, but it was like a book on convenience stores in Toronto. 
And before okay. I left Toronto last year, I drove around to all of the places I shot and five of them are no longer in business. So I took a picture of them on pack film of what they look like today. And so the second edition cool. that I'm going to do is going to have like their deceased photos in there um, alongside the other ones. Um, I did a book on, um, it's a Polaroid book of photos taken during the first lockdown in Toronto. Mm. Um, I called it Quarantinaroids and, uh, it's a uh, Quarantinaroids, the first 53 days of lockdown on Polaroid. And, uh, it's, uh, it was just a sort of challenge to myself to try and keep my sanity of like, you know, take at least two Polaroid photos a day of just like whatever Thank I was doing. You. Just, oh, talk about like an inspiration zapper that was. I, I just, I, oh, was I fell into a hole. I'm finally just feeling inspired now uh, after a year of living here. Like I, even moving back home, like when I would like go shoot around like in different states and stuff or like leave beautiful San Francisco and go like central California and which is beautiful too, but I'm just saying like, somewhere different and I'd go shoot all like the old detritus and like, Oh, look at all the broken down bits here and there. Um, that was what always inspired me. But since moving back home, I'm almost like, Oh my God, it's like I'm photographing my own area and my own neighbors or something. I felt really weird about it. Um, but now that I've been here a little longer, I'm starting to kind of feel my, my uh, inspiration kind of bubble up again. And, um, but I'm definitely susceptible to that. Like, like you know, we kind of touched on it before about just like getting into a wall where you're just like, I can't, you know, like the thought of picking up a camera is just like, for what, you know, <laughs> why would I do that? Yeah. I'm, I've been in that, um, for like the last month now. Um, yeah. I, I've got like, I got a, a bunch of rolls of film that I need to mail off to downtown camera for processing but I'm waiting to finish the role that's in my F5 right now. And I think I have like six. You have an F5? Yeah. Yeah. His, uh, his name's Woodrow, um, a tribute nice. to Woody Guthrie. And I painted nice. on, on the bottom grip. It says this machine stops time. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. That's great. That's such a good to him. Um, I have an F5. I, I love it, man. I, I kind of like, it's like the closest thing I have, I think to like, a digital camera because it's so easy to use. It's, it's, it's so, but it's beautiful. I have a, a really cool, like, I think it's a uh, 55 millimeter 1.2 lens on it. Oh, nice. It's so cool, man. I got that. I got to give a shout out to my, my guys, uh, at glass key photo. Gordon and Matt, they're, they're unbelievable people. They keep the film, Spirit alive in San Francisco. They're it. They're, I mean, they're amazing. Like yep. Seawood Photo um, up north also holds it down, but talk about chemicals and film cameras and film. Glass Key, another instrumental part of me getting back into it. If it weren't for them, I, I just, you know, if it's just hard enough, maybe I wouldn't have done it, you know? Maybe I would have been like, well, I got this crappy camera that I kind of like using. You know, maybe I would have faltered at some point, but instead I just went crazy and bought all these cameras and, you know, had people to like face to face, talk to about it, you know, and answer questions. And they were, they're great dudes. They're, they're amazing. So if you're ever in San Francisco, you got to stop in there. I, so I, I did get to stop by Glass Key when I went to the Pool Combe area. Um, Cause I was there. Oh, for, you did. I was there for the first one when COVID shut the city down. I was there too, Merlin. I was at that. You were? How did we not cross paths then? <laughs> I think it's because we were all so freaked out still. Like, I literally went in and out. Like, I was so just like, I don't know if we should be here. You know, it was just such weird times. So I made like a very brief pass through in and out. Okay. That's probably why I missed Brian you then. High- yeah, I gave Brian a high five and out. That was it. But it was cool. I was like, it it was a was surreal happy. trip because I'd never seen yeah. San Francisco so dead in all the time I've spent in it than that weekend. Bizarre, right? Yeah, it was creepy. Like it's uh, it, 
And uh, I, I don't know if you ever, if you follow uh, Theory of a Brian, um, another great Polaroid photographer, but you know, Brian and his partner, Mary, are a couple of my favorite people. And uh, we shared a hostel at the Green Tortoise in uh, the Stripper District there. And uh, nice. yeah, that that's my go-to spot. If I'm going to San Francisco on my own dime, I always stay at the Green Tortoise because it's way cheaper than any hotel. Like it's... I don't know if I know that one. Um, are you talking about, is it in the Tenderloin? Uh, it's right across from, um, oh, fuck. Not Zanzibar. Garden of Eden. Like, oh, yeah. there's all those, okay. like, strip joints there, and then there's, like, around, uh, it's right by um, the Hemingway Museum. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, man. Yeah. That's a neat area. I mean, I, uh, I've had good friends live all over that town obviously i lived there for almost 17 years so it's i love my time in san francisco and i always look forward to going back um and it's weird though like it was it was odd like living in that town knowing how fun that town can be and then just how much it like just stopped happening i don't know it was a weird time to be in san francisco for sure it was weird it really was how, yeah How's Vancouver right now? How's that going? Vancouver is different. Um, COVID never really existed here, which was a very big difference from Toronto, where like you know, my partner and I lived in Toronto during lockdown, and uh, shit was scary, and it was like it was really real. And then we moved out here, and everyone's like, the supposed pandemic. <laughs> it's just like, are we in? Danger? Oh, really? That's how. That's how. Vancouver, really? Wow. Yeah, like there was a very different attitude out here in in the West, like lackadaisical, and some people took it seriously, but then other people were just like, eh. It was it was weird. Yeah. Like the you know, the first like half year I was here, I was just like, I'm in danger, like all the time. Yeah, man, I feel you. That's how our first year here in Iowa felt. <laughs> yeah, we were. I mean. It, we were just like, it was a, it was like, I guess you would say it's a cheap culture shock. It's completely different than where I've been for the last, I mean, over 20 years, because I was in Colorado before that. I was in Boulder, you know, talk about a bubble of a place, you know, like, it, it couldn't get more different than the three places I'm living in, you know, I mean, like, they're all completely unique. So, I don't know. I mean, like I say, how long have you been in Vancouver now? Sorry about that. Um, it was a year in May, but this isn't the first time I've lived in Vancouver. Like, um, I, I'm originally oh. a West Coaster, so uh, Tor- oh, Toronto was my first time out east. Uh, but I grew up out in BC, so coming I back. I mean, it's so funny. when you look at Canada, like that is so far away. <laughs> Toronto and Vancouver. I mean, obviously they'd be different. It's like it's completely. I mean, you might as well be in a different country. Well, in in Toronto, honestly does feel like a bit of a different country like it's um it, it was very really, european well a little bit but also like kind of american in in just like you know the just the sort of curtness that people have there um people are a little more real there than in other parts of Canada, like other parts of Canada, you have like the, the posturing, like, you know, they're, they're polite, but really they're kind of assholes. Um, Toronto is just like, you know, it is what it is kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and it's also truly multicultural. Um, Toronto has kind of ruined Vancouver for me a little bit because like Vancouver doesn't feel like a city anymore. It feels like a metropolitan hick town. Um, huh. And it, it's small, like Vancouver. I think they just crested over a million people here in Vancouver. Toronto in the Grand uh, Greater Toronto area, I think, is like nearly eight million people. Wow! And like in in the downtown core, it's like you know a few million people there. So it's just like, yeah, comparative, um, you know, oh, Vancouver to Toronto, yeah. like you know, it's it's, it's very different. Um, like Vancouver is not even really a suburb of like Toronto with the, the size it has. That's interesting. Like, I mean. You know, the biggest city I've ever lived in is San Francisco. Obviously, I've spent time in large cities. Like, I've had the, uh, I was so lucky enough to go spend a little time in uh, Tokyo and 
um, uh, New York and, you know, places like that. And, and there, you, you just know it, you feel it. I mean, it's so different. You know, the, the amount of people. Um, so I'm excited to see Toronto. This will be my first time there for sure. How long, um, we how, went, how long are you going to be in Toronto? Not long, bro. Like okay. it's going to be probably a day in the night. So I'll, I'll get to just go and then we're out. So it's, it's sort of just a road trip around and, it's just a chance to go see it because then we're going to go to Maine and whatnot. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll send you a couple of places to check out if you have time, like food wise. Um, there's some really awesome oh, that'd be, stuff to try. Yeah. There. That'd be great, man. That'd be great. I'd really appreciate that. So uh, other than road trips, um, do you have any, any projects that you're working on, like books that you're putting out or things like that? You know, it's funny, man. I've, I've, I've not even put out a zine. Um, I've, I've never done the book thing or the zine thing. I've talked about it. I've got all kinds of ideas about it. I have, I keep notes about it. Um, I'm a perpetual, uh, project starter and, and I, I do not finish them, but I gave myself a goal to do three zines this year. And obviously I should have just set a goal of just doing something. Right. Yeah. Um, but I do. I, I've got um, a lot of work. I the way I kind of do stuff is I put work in like little piles of that could be something maybe or that could be something. And so definitely, there's a few different projects I always do. Um, one of which I think is what kind of kept. So I'm a um, a failed Catholic, you could say. I was brought up Catholic, and then I found the evil punk rock music, right? And um, that opens eyes. And I was lucky enough, like, my mother was Catholic, and her whole side of the family was Catholic. My father believed in Bob Dylan, you know? <laughs> Bob Dylan, that's my dad's religion. And so um, I got kind of both roles all the time, you know? But he was real easy, set, careful, step in and made sure that, you know, I mean, I went to private Catholic school, the whole deal. And, um, and so like, I think something that has always stuck to me though, is the imagery, right? All the, all the imagery of Catholicism. And so throughout this last year, um, and, and way before, like, if I see like, it can be anything like, and it can, and it, lo- it looks like a cross or something, you know what I mean? And so I'll take photos of it. Like if it, even if it's like an overgrown, like there's this uh, photo I took one time of uh, power lines, which is an easy one. They always look like a cross, but uh, this was just kind of all overgrown with ivy, and there was no wires on it anymore. It was just in the middle of a field, and it looked like a cross. Uh, and I just, you know, so I, I always photograph stuff like that. And while I was in my, I mean, month long slump recently, um, I I just bought a bunch of old pack film. I spent way too much money on it. Who cares? And just started photographing churches around uh, the Midwest. Because there's one thing the Midwest is known for is that there's a bunch of religious folks here. You know, I mean, there just is. I mean, mm-hmm. it, it's, I don't know if people consider Iowa to be part of the Bible, Bible Belt, but it is. I mean, the Lutheran religions, Catholicism, tons of the, that. There's just churches everywhere. You know, like, if you, when we like explore different towns and when you know we're going to go through stuff, my partner and I, uh, she'll look up post offices to photograph and I always look up what the churches look like. But not just churches in the town per se, but like on the outside of the town, right? And inevitable, inevitably when you type in church, like 30 to 40 churches pop up in the area and you're just like, whew, that's wild. So I've been just taking especially the old expired stuff and um, like real old stuff, not the new expired stuff, like the old expired stuff. And again, it's real hit and miss some, a little bit about like how that film is going to turn out. And it's real kind of touchy. You got to use like a filter. Uh, thanks Raymond Molinar for telling me about that. And he's like, hey, you shoot the blue, you got to get a filter, man. So uh, to kind of correct that change in the color and, um, So I've just been shooting these old churches out here. So that's going to become something because even though like people hold their religion super dear here in the Midwest, um, it's dying too. 
You know what I mean? Like this, this myth of like the great USA and, and the, we're the best and, and, uh, you know, like, Oh, there's just, there's a few things we care about. It's pride and country and the Lord. And I gotta be honest, man, they, they stopped caring about the institution, the building at least, because so often we come and it's just like, these things are just in ruins, if not truly in ruins. And I mean, you know, as a, as a, I jokingly say failed Catholic. That was by choice. I didn't fail. I just said, see you around. Um, I find it beautiful. I find it so, I don't know. I kind of find it hysterical, to be honest with you. Not, not to, you know, bum anybody out there who, who ha- wants to believe in something. I mean, my, my sister's totally involved in her church, and I fully respect that if you need that. That's what you, you, you know, I need photography. So what? It doesn't matter. But for me, like, there's nothing more beautiful than a fallen down church. Just, you know, you guys couldn't even care about that. You know, <laughs> like, nobody, nobody put forth the effort to save that even in this town. That's when I'm, like, I know I'm in the right town to photograph them, you know? Like, holy shit, you guys you even gave up on your church. But there's still people living there. Like, you know, they go out on the outskirts and they, they go to the new Tin Shed Church or they go... And you know all their conven- all their stores are dead in town, but they go to the to the to the convenience store on the outskirts of town. That's where they do their grocery shopping. You know, that to me sums up the Midwest so well. You know, like the little town I'm in right now, our downtown is they're trying to revitalize it, right? Because it completely died. And what they do, they they gave tax breaks to all these big box stores. So the outside of our town is just all full of box, big box stores. You know, yeah. we don't, it's a town of 80,000 people. There's three Walmarts. What the fuck you need That's three insane. Walmarts for? Thank you. I think it's so they can just put the final death nail in the downtown here. And, and luckily through, through like a lot of hard work and community involvement, our little downtown is starting to kind of pick itself back up a little bit. And it's just funny to like, the, the more I travel around, which is pretty extensive right now, traveling through the Midwest, because having grown up here, I didn't give a shit about traveling around the Midwest. I wanted out of the Midwest. I didn't want to see any more of it. I knew what it was in my mind, right? Mm-hmm. But now as an adult coming back, and especially someone who enjoys photography and has this reason to go to these towns, Outside of just like, whoa, look at this place. I enjoy photographing these small towns. And so that's another huge project of mine is just documenting like, you know, you hear this rah, 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 like America's the best. We're killing it. We're the best. Oh my God. We're teaching other people how to be civilized. But you forgot about a huge section of your country. I mean, the Midwest was forgotten about. At least that's how it looked. But it's not even the Midwest, though, Merlin. It's, it's any rural area. You can go to anywhere outside of big cities in California, and it's exactly like the Midwest. I don't care. Where, where you go in the country, if it's rural, it's going to be, it's going to, it's going to all have the stores that are closed, the churches that are falling down. It's pretty rough, you know? And it's just something that, like, has really caught my eye. You well, know, so while somebody, and that, that's something that also happens in, in like large cities too. Like, you know, sure. Vancouver, Vancouver is a large city here, but, um, you know, it's, it's been known for a long time that like, you know, Vancouver is kind of skid row, um, is, is basically like Maine and Hastings, like down to like, uh, Camby and Hastings, like around there. And it's been like that for decades, right in the middle yeah. of like this, like prosperous town is a huge like you know homeless like derelict issue where there used to be tons of prosperous businesses all through there but now it's just like sros and some convenience stores and then like boarded up shops because you know no one wants to wander around that part of like hastings because it's it's just so so derelict so it's it's not only the the small towns that we've forgotten about like you know we've forgotten about chunks of our our city where it's just it's easier to turn a blind eye away from that and you know be like oh i'm just gonna go do my business over here instead than actually help people and i think in both instances you know like what you're saying and i mean you know i have no solutions for that stuff my 
my whole point of talking about this is, is just the fact that like it's all around us. You know what I mean? Like, like, like for me with photography, like I, I, it's weird to say it, but like I get an enjoyment out of these areas, right? Like I, I, I get, I get benefit out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's just kind of funny to like know that like, cause San Francisco has the same problem. I mean, are you kidding me? It's horrible. I mean, there's a, there's a horrible, um, homeless problem. I mean, it is a problem not because they're homeless because they're homeless. You know what I mean, like I have no problem with a homeless person. I don't see them as the problem. The problem is that in this affluent ass place that I can barely afford to live in when I owned a business for 15 years, these people aren't the problem. The problem is that they, that, that this is existing in that town, you know? Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, it is a, it is a huge problem and, and one that like, can can easily be overlooked in a big town because you can just be like, well, put them over there and just forget about it, you know. Um, and I, and I sort of feel like in the larger scheme of things, that's sort of what has happened in rural America. Ah, it, it doesn't matter, yeah. you know. Just go to the big and city. It's just funny how back and really experience that is what I guess I'm, is what I'm saying as far as like because now I have a reason to go and to these places for myself and, and really see them, you know, like, cause you know, I knew where I grew up, but I didn't explore around, you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's just very interesting that much of the Midwest reminds me of much of the central California and much of like, you know, all these other little towns, like in, in Texas, very similar, you know, very similar to these small towns. And I don't know, like to me, it just makes me kind of reflect on it. Like, you know, you hear all this, like, this preaching about how great everything is, and then you see these towns, and you're like, it's not great here. <laughs> it's not. So that someday will hopefully turn into a project of some sort. I don't know. Well, I just don't know how loud it <laughs> and, and the whole greatness thing is interesting, too. Like, I was watching this, like, news thing where, um, I can't remember, it, some, some, like, city official was being, like, grilled about, like, how many, like, shooting incidents have happened in, in their, like, you know, city or whatever, and um, a British lady was like asking the questions and, um, you know, the lady's like, well, you, you have like mass stabbing issues in your country. And the lady was so like flabbergasted by, it. she didn't even really know how to respond. Like mass stabbing. Like it's, it's not even on the same level as like the mass shooting thing. And then there was this guy that did a video where he was like, he, he took that, um, interview clip and he's like, I went back through like the history records in, in the UK to figure out how many like deaths from like mass, whatever have happened to equal what has happened in the U S in the first six months of this year. And he's like, yo, guess how many months I went back? And he's like, it wasn't months. It wasn't even years. It was centuries. He had to go back like over like a hundred some years to get, the same amount of deaths from like mass, whatever events to match the first six months of this year. And it's like, you know, how, how is that great? Like it's a big number, I guess that's good. Right. I don't know. Like, yeah, I don't know. It's so weird. It, it like, like to like have that argument in the first place, of course it's silly. It's, it's an answer. Like, yeah. Well, but look at you. It just shows how, like, adults are children. Like, like, you can't, it, that's like, that's like mean to children to call adults children. Like, when a children's an asshole, we should say, boy, you're really being an adult right now. You know, because, like, I've never met worse people than adults. You know what I mean? Like, we're horrible people. I mean, we just are, because we just, yeah you get to a point where you become more and more selfish, which is just, just human nature as a, as a species, it's just what we are. You know what I mean? Like you give anybody enough money, they're going to take over somebody else. Just how it works. You know, at least that's how it seems to have worked so far. So again, like, I guess that's just through my photography. I've noticed that like, it's just something that like town after town, after town, after town, after town, after town you know, and, and, and we're, you know, everybody's going to be proud on the fourth and we're all very excited, you know, and stuff, but like, 
You know, and in, in, in these small towns, they have more American flags up than anybody else. They're very proud. And it just, but it's like, but you don't have a, you don't have a, you have a grocery store. I mean, you, you've got a convenience store you have to go to, or you have to go to the next town. I, I don't know. It's, it's just something I've noticed, a pattern I've noticed now in more the, and more that I'm, that these rural places to photograph. And, and the pride is kind of misplaced. Like you know, the the flag thing is interesting because I, I was talking to my partner about this last night um, because I've noticed in in Canada here when I see people with flags, it's it's almost triggering to me now. Where I'm like, oh, you are people I don't want to be around. Um, the because, Canadian, yeah, the Canadian flag because of it. it has been co opted by all of these like freedom fuckers that are like out there trying to like, you know, save us from ourselves and, and shit like that. So whenever I see like cars driving by with a Canadian flag or like, you know, people waving it around and stuff, it, it's like a triggering thing for me now where I'm just like, Ugh, I, I don't want to see that anymore because like, I don't want to have to remember what that's been co opted by and you know, what, what's well, been like the, the misplaced I mean, pride in it. You, you know that what we just went through for four years. So, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more about the co-opted thing and, and the way that the American flag makes me feel now. And um, That's funny you say that because whenever I see a Canadian flag, I'm like, oh, Canadian. I love, I love Canadians. Like, you guys seem such, such a peaceful people. And so, <laughs> so it's such a beautiful place. I don't know. It's, it's just funny. Like, the American flag, it makes me feel the same way, man. You know, it's a... Uh, yeah, I don't know. Or like, uh, pray, there's a thing around my, my, the town I live in now where it just says, uh, pray for our country. Because, uh, I mean, thoughts I mean, and prayers have worked so well you know, up until now. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I know what that means. I know who you are and I know what that means. You know? Well, in the thing so, with Canada, like, it totally is a beautiful place. It's, it's absolutely a beautiful place. Um, I, I won't, um, take that away from it. Um, but Canada has fantastic marketing. Um, we've been able to market away how racist we are. Um, the fact that we're still committing genocide and, and killing people inside of our own country right now, we're, we're really good at hiding that as well too. Um, there, there's a lot of like ugliness about Canada that, um, people don't, get to hear about and then there's just the people who live inside of the country too and um it's it's weird because like i i love my country and i'm grateful to live in in this land um but i don't know how i feel about being canadian anymore but then it's like what place would I feel good about being because like no one really has a good story right now. Like, you know, humans are kind of the worst and <laughs> we just do all this like kind of douchebaggery. I, I think the one thing that I'm getting a bit tired about is, um, all of the like acknowledgements we give without actually doing anything towards it. Um, and there was this comedian that I came across recently, um, star Stavro something. He's, he's fucking hilarious, but he has this like, thing where he talks about how he finds Canada a bit ridiculous with these like land acknowledgement things because he's just like it's just so like disingenuous yeah. it's like you know I, I go into someone's house and I'm like this is, this is a great house bro I'm, get out I'm taking the house and it's like every day you I wake up in this house and I open the window and I'm like oh hey bro you're still there great house I love it no you can't come back in you you stay you stay there um, but it's rad I love living here it's amazing best place ever um i feel really bad no you can't come back in no no you you stay out there but i feel bad about it. i just want you to know i feel bad about this bro but thank you but no you can't come back right. in and <laughs> it's kind of totally what it's all like we're acknowledging that we took this away from them but we're not doing anything towards actually making it right yeah it's just it can be it can, i mean it is lip service it's just uh, and and, and what they're going to do, you know, it, it's tough. I mean, I guess there's, you know, some will argue that there's a place to start and hopefully uh, then real action will, will, will go from there. Maybe that'll be normalized and then real action can start. And I think some people are doing, taking some real action. Um, I've always kind of thought it, it, it's interesting when people, 
um, give their land back, right? Here, here you have it. You know, um, here in America that happens very little, yeah. um, but it, it happens um, and does happen. Yeah, man, it's, uh, but you're right. You're right to say like, but where do you go? Because yeah. it ain't Europe, <laughs> you know, it's not South America. It's, you know, Africa sounds tough, you know, so it's like, it's just, where do you go? I mean, you, so you just try to make your own home a cleaner, nicer, happier, more inviting, more inclusive place, you know? And that's kind of what I gotta be honest, Merlin, like that's kind of really tough for me because, um, you know, just even like with the recent stuff with, uh, um, the Supreme court, um, taking away what I thought was just a common thing, you know, growing up my whole life, that's just been Roe versus Wade was just a thing. And, and the woman's right to choose is just a thing. And as a white man, it's, it's, I sat out and cause for the first time I'm actually in a place where I'm the minority and thinking a certain way. Whereas in Boulder, maybe there's just more lip service, but everybody seems liberal there, right? And San Francisco is known as a liberal mecca and all that. Um, but I actually have a story about it, right? Like I, I've experienced, um, I've gotten to the benefit out of the right to choose, um, having gone to a situation where that was a necessity. Um, otherwise, the child would have come to term and, would have been born dead possibly or, or dead shortly thereafter. So I, I got, I got, um, I was able to, uh, benefit actually from the, you know, as a man, um, a uh, woman's right to choose, but I gotta be honest, like when I was standing next to, you know, in out in the middle of my little town, uh, with a sign and all this stuff, you know, uh, uh, you know, pro choice is it might, you know, all that stuff. And I was very happy and felt the need to preach here in Iowa for the side I think is right. Because honestly, you know, it's a Republican state. This is a state that doesn't, that they are going to eventually probably take away the right to choose and the, and the right to have an abortion. Um, South Dakota, the state that neighbors me, like literally you go over a bridge in my hometown and you're in South Dakota. And, it's illegal now. You can't have an abortion. You know what I mean? And, and for me personally, like, you know, if you don't want it, don't, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. And so that's my point of view. So I was, I was happy to do that, but I did feel like I was out of place. Like it wasn't my place, but it is my place. It's all of our places. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, like, cool. like everybody should have the right to live a happy and healthy life. You know what I mean? And, and so like when, you know, I, to bring it back to photography, I struggle with like, what, what is my work doing? Is there going to be any message behind it? Or is it just like, here's another broken down church and here's another broken down building, or is there going to be some real thoughts behind it? Which can be a little paralyzing, honestly. Like, I mean, talk about a project killer when you're trying to put like a bunch of thought and you know, not thought, there's always thought into it, but like a big message behind it. But we're a visual world, you know what I mean? So images are powerful and can be powerful and have, to have changed minds and have changed thoughts. And it just, so when I'm looking at these little projects I'm doing, I have started to think more like, what's, what, why am I doing this? Like, what's the purpose of taking p pictures of broken down shit in small towns? Why am I doing it? Is it because I'm like, wow, you guys are fucked up? Or is it because I'm like sad that it's like that? You know, what, what's the point? You know, well, I think without getting too much into analysis paralysis about that kind of stuff, because it's it's easy where you could just like spin your wheels trying to like come up with like the why. Um, you take pictures of them because they make you feel something, and those are sometimes the, well, the not some those are always the best pictures is um, something that makes you feel, and then something that makes other people feel even if it's not the same thing that you felt when you looked at it, 
like those are my favorite pictures like when i'm scrolling through like there's lots of really pretty pictures and like well done photos but a lot of them feel like benign like they don't really like it's it's a pretty picture and you can say yeah that's a great picture but when you're scrolling through and you see one that looks like you something snaps and you and you look at it and you're just like it makes you feel something you know th- those are the best pictures and and you know maybe that's part of the road trip adventures you're out there doing is like you're finding these things that like there's something that makes you pull over to to take a picture of that thing um and then just like one one thing on the the row wade thing it i'm just like everyone else pissed at the um you know justices for for what they did there but honestly i'm more angry at all of the politicians over the last several decades who had several opportunities to actually codify this into real law and not just some sort of thing to reference to they've had so much time to actually make this a real thing and put legitimate real protections in place and none of them did that and also here in canada our current prime minister and leader of our country is doing the lip service thing and he's saying how important it is and all that stuff but he's also not doing any movements to codify and protect those things here in our country. And those are being attacked right now in our country by conservative stuff. And there's a very high probability that Canada will follow suit and that will also become illegal up here. And that's a terrifying thing to think about um, because it's not only the right to choose if you want to have a kid or not, but it's a, it's the right to choose if you're going to live or not, if you have a medical emergency that requires an abortion because there's so many medical emergencies that can happen where the resolution to them is an abortion. And now all those people that need that life-saving service down in these states that are eliminating it are being sentenced to death by a bunch of white people that think they know better. And it's, it's atrocious. Pretty gross. I mean, I, that was just... Usually I can sort of uh, compartmentalize my outrage about stuff, you know, and kind of like, holy fuck, what the fuck? And I mean, like I say, we just spent four years going, oh, what? Another thing? Um, but this one I just couldn't get past because, like, like I say, I have this, I have an experience. And I, I, I know people who it was just so important, you know, and they're, and they're just well-being. Um even just mental health, mm-hmm. not just in mental health, you know, like just being able to know that there is a, a solution they saw, right. And they're able to do that. And, uh, I know it was just a really fucked up day. And, and again, like my partner asked, are you going to, are you going to bring a camera? Or are you going to shoot photos? No, <laughs> you know, I didn't at all. Um, Alex, so actually, you, I'm sure you're familiar with his work, Alec. So he's a magnum photographer. Yeah. He's from Minnesota. Just outstanding large format stuff, like just really next level, beautiful storyteller, right? Um, and he was actually talking to some folks about like, hey, did you, he was chatting with this other photographer and, and asked her like, did you go shoot photos? And, um, she was like, no. And I was like, whoa, that's funny. I, I literally just had that conversation with my partner and, and she asked me and I said, no, I, you know, this now is not the time for me to shoot photos. I feel like more is the time to listen and, and, and just show my outrage. Um, and that's sort of what that photographer, that magnet photographer was, was saying. She was like, you know, if I wanted to actually help the world, I become a teacher. Mm-hmm. You know, my photography is not helping the world. Like if I really wanted to help, I'd be a teacher or I'd do something along those lines or I'd do some sort of community outreach. But I wonder if that's true though. You know what I mean? Like, and I guess that's, this is an ongoing internal conversation I've had for years now. Like, A, do I even have anything to say? Yes. B, do I, do, do I even know how to like make it a, a cohesive story? You know what I mean? Like something that would make sense. Time will tell, 
you know, but I think it is important to, to try to have some sort of, um, narrative for me personally, yeah. that, that has a deeper meaning, but you're right. Like I could always tell when somebody is photographing some, I mean, always, but I, I assume when it catches my, I'm like, Oh, that, that's something precious to that person. So that person, you know, felt something during that photograph, you know? Well, and, like and also saying. too is like, you know, don't sell yourself short because, um, you may not think the things you share and post and whatnot are making a difference at all, but you'd be surprised at how much of a difference they can make without you even knowing about it. Um, yeah. I, I see that though. I see what you're saying. Cause like, I, like I was even saying way earlier in the conversation, like just through inspiration, you know, like I find inspiration in people's photographs all the time. I don't have to be like moved to like action. I just am moved by the photographs, you know? So there's worth in that too. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't overthink yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, as you can see, I probably do that sometimes. <laughs> I mean, I really do. I, um, I suffer from the same thing too. Like it's just, you know, creative curse and, and whatnot. But, um, you know, it, Dave, uh, Sinadar, he has a great thing where it's like, you know, think less, shoot more. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, honestly, like when you were just saying like that about like what catches your eyes, and I think that's why I even photograph how I do photograph, right? Like, and nothing against studio photographers. They're seeing something in what they're shooting in their studio. I mean, they're obviously it moves them, right? Or they're not going to be able to capture it how they captured it or, or put a, put their stamp on it, right? So, so that's cool. That's not how I can do it. Like, I have to find something that exists in my world as I'm passing by and go, what was that? Yeah. And you know what? Sometimes it doesn't translate. It doesn't show itself in the photograph. And sometimes I get stuff that are like, that might be good. And it's just amazing. Like, wow, that really did turn out how I hoped it would, you know? Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with the shooting of film for me, you know, like, like I don't, I don't have to worry about later on going, okay, now I get to make it look this way. I pick a film stock, I, you know, I either push or pull it. I make those decisions in house at the time, at the moment. And then that's going to translate hopefully into what I'm seeing. Um, I love that about, you know, the, the film shooting. I love that. You know, I, I, at that moment, I, cause I, I'm sure you have this, you have a film stock you enjoy, right? And you know how they're going to look. Yeah. Or at least an idea, right? And you know how you like to shoot those different film stocks. So with that in your mind, you then are seen that way almost. Do you get in that mode where you see photographs? Because if I'm trying to do something else, I can't see photographs. But when I'm actually doing shooting photography, man, I can. it's, it's all around me. I see photographs. It's really interesting. I, I like see photographs the all the time. Like there's yeah. <laughs> ton, tons of times, like when I'm just driving around, I'll be like, that would be a rad photo. Um, and I don't have like a camera with me. And then sometimes there's like, that would be a rad photo, but I'd never take it because um, I don't want to exploit the person. That'd be the subject of it and things like that. So it's like, it is kind of interesting. Like, as I've been noticing more about my own eye is just like, where it comes through and in what I see, but with the stock thing, hundred percent, like that's why I like film over digital is now that I know how some stocks behave, I'm like, okay, I want this feeling today. And as long as I don't fuck up my exposure or focus, all the pictures are going to be how I want them because I pick that stock. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and it's so cool too. Cause like, um, the more I dove into like film photography. I keep, it's so weird because I don't usually say film photography, but that's what I do. Um, I, I was so stuck on, I shoot Portra 160. I shoot Ilford 100. That's it. Delta 100 and Portra 160. And then I, re I really had to like step back and um, I, I, I started playing with a bunch of different film stocks. You know what I mean? And, and, and experimenting, I went through that whole aspect of it 
for like a couple of years actually. And now when I, when I load Portra 160 back in, it's like literally like going back and like, ah, oh, I remember how to shoot this stuff. Like, this is great. It still really feels like natural. I don't know why, but that's like the Portra 160 and the O for Delta 100 are just like, I really love the way they, for me, how they look. I just love it, you know? So it's interesting, like when you, you know, are getting into something like this and then all of a sudden you, you, uh, you find the next layer and the next layer and, Oh man, do you know about this film and that film? And you get to talk to everybody about it. And then you get to experiment and you get to do it, you know, more than likely you're going to go, you're going to find the one you like or the few that you like and, and really, uh, I don't know, just find your style you could say or something, you know? Absolutely. And, and then you start seeing that way. You know, that's for me, I see like that, you know, like I, I'm like, I already know how this is going to look now. Can I actually make what I'm seeing translate? Well, you know, I love that. I love it, man. I just, I'm so fucking hooked on it. <laughs> I really am. I just can't get enough of it, you know? And right now it's funny. Cause like it goes nowhere. It goes on Instagram and someone sees it for four seconds. If they last that long and it's gone for it's just there it's just there but for me it's a literal act of finding things to photograph and then photographing them the rest is like almost like a hassle to me <laughs> getting it processed processing it now myself because there's no place to go i send it to the darkroom lab or i'll i'll send it uh to the fine folks uh back in sf but um, I don't know. I, I, uh, I've been trying to be more hands on and like soon I'm going to finally get a dark room built as I've been talking about for years and, um, really take a stab at the rest of that. But, but honestly, outside of the actual act of searching for photographs and seeing photographically, the rest is fine, but <laughs> that's the part I really enjoy. I really love that, you know? That's like, do you get nervous when you still work? Oh, a hundred percent. Um, yeah, I, I get nervous about that all the time. Like it's, uh, yeah. Sometimes it feels really like, overwhelming because like, you're just like, Oh my God, are they going to see how I want to see it? Um, but yeah. My, I always second guess, like, is this the right photo? Like, should I have not? Is this the one I should show or, or, you know, like even up to when they're hung on the wall, like now, it's, uh, you know, this isn't right. <laughs> it's ridiculous. So that's I how I am. such a hard time picking because I, I have like thousands and thousands of photos I've taken and, um, I forget, like sometimes I'll go through like the archives and I'll be like, holy, when did I take that thing? Like, and it, it's kind of wild. Uh, looking back at it because like I forget about how much stuff because like I just used to shoot insane amounts when I lived in Toronto just because like yeah I was going through probably between like five to nine rolls a week on average really that's awesome oh it it was a lot of fun uh Vancouver I I haven't been shooting as much film because like you know I the labs aren't the same here and it just like it feels different and that got me in a funk with things and you know the new studio is helping get me out of that but you know now now i don't know what i want to be when i grow up and so i'm like having that uh that crisis right now <laughs> i know I'm, I'm having this weird like i'm 42 soon so i'm having this weird like wow i'm 42 and i'm like it's almost like i'm starting over i mean i moved here a year ago back to the town I grew up in, you know, bought a house, became an adult, you know, did all that stuff. And now I'm like, what am I going to do with my life? <laughs> I'm kind of in the same, same thing, you know, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> right I mean, now I'm going to keep on buying cameras. It, yeah, exactly. Keep on, keep on buying cameras. Like I'm, I'm 41 this year and I did all the things that I was supposed to do that they tell you you're supposed to do that are supposed to lead to happiness and none of it really worked. <laughs> so now it's just like, you know, I'm 41. 
I live in this studio basement apartment of this really kind Ukrainian lady who's very interesting. And, um, you know, yeah, 40 didn't seem at all what I thought, you know, 40 was, was going to end up being. So just like, yeah, I have no idea. Um, what the heck I'm doing, but I know I'm going to be a Policon this year. So definitely come down to Texas. Oh, did, did I use it there? Can you hear me, bro? Yeah, you're back. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying, man? I am not good at this at all. My girlfriend started my van to go to the store real quick, and my van just will sync to my phone. Oh. <laughs> and so that's what happened. It just is like, you're no longer where you are. You're in the van now. So I'm sure she was listening to us in the van. <laughs> yeah, you, your your girlfriend was probably like hearing me talk about like my like you know I guess near midlife crisis. <laughs> Aren't we supposed to? Isn't forty supposed to be like the over the hill thing? Remember that back in the day when everybody said fifty. Like, I remember over my dad. The hill. 40. So we're, fifty is now. Yeah, we're we're like okay. we're 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 cresting the top right now. So it's, we're getting close to the hill. Yeah, but I mean, also with, like, how fucked up everything is right now, like, you know, I think 40 is, like, the new 50. Um, I'm going to try to find some light real quick. Give me one second. I don't this is know. weird. I was, I was going to try to... There, how's that? A little bit better. I'm in this room. I'm, we, we have, like, this, like, old sunroom, and, uh... It's great. I love it. But there's no lights in here. Like, literally not a light <laughs> in this room. So Yeah, and you're losing daylight <laughs> out there, I notice. Huh? And it looks like it's uh, you're losing some daylight there. We sure are. Yeah, good old Iowa. We're in the uh, central standard time. So we're, we're Chicago time. Uh, it's, so I think it's like 930. Ah, you lucky dog. It's, it's, it's super oh. bright here so. It's quite insane. so beautiful. I know. Yeah, it's like it, it's nighttime. We're getting we're getting late. Um, well, do I? What do we? What else do we? I, I think we covered all the things, uh, and, and then some. Yay. so I, I do. I really well, did we solve anything? <laughs> um, well, we determined you're going to Texas. So I mean, that, yeah, that's, that's, that's no thing. doubt. Yeah, yeah, that should be able to happen, man. Yeah, for sure. It, it and then be, I'll give you a really hard time about coming to the to the uh, Halloween show in Nashville. I, I will do my best about that one. So we'll, we'll it, see. It's, that. it's ridiculous to do it, but you really should do it. It'll be really fun. <laughs> well, uh, we'll see. We'll see where it goes. Um, but it would be rad to catch up with you in Texas. And do thank you so much it for uh, coming to hang out with me. Um, I think I'm going to grab yeah, some man. food here. I can. I can tell. I'm like running out of steam a little bit, but, uh, I feel it. it was so rad chatting with you. Um, I'm going to get the outro going here and, uh, Woo. you know, I hope you have a good rest of, uh, your, uh, week and a good weekend. Um, Thank you. next week I'm going to be having, uh, Zena and Charles on their, um, going to be in an in-person chat so they're going to come here to my studio because they're residents in the lodge here as well they uh the two of them form zuckerman and wong photography and um yeah it should be really interesting chatting with them it's uh always fun the technical challenge of uh these in-person lives versus doing it this way but uh yeah it should be a lot of fun and dude thank you so much for hanging out with me Man, it was a pleasure, and, and thank you so much for wanting me on the show. Um, um, I, I really do appreciate it. Appreciate the time. I appreciate you too, man. We'll talk soon. All right. All right. Cheers, everyone. Later. Bye. Bye.